Uh, the subcommittee on health will now come to order. Uh, due to COVID-19, today's hearing is being held remotely and all members and witnesses will be participating by a video conferencing. As part of our hearing, uh, microphones will be set on mute to eliminate background noise and members and witnesses um, will need to unmute uh, their microphone each time uh, you wish to speak. Uh, documents for the record should be sent to Megan Mullen at the email address we've provided uh, to your staff. All documents will be entered into the record at the conclusion of the hearing. The chair now recognizes herself for five minutes for an opening statement. Uh, a U.S. law prohibits Medicare from negotiating directly with drug companies. We're the only developed country in the world uh, with such a law, and because of that, Americans are paying three to four times more for prescription drugs than other countries. We can change that. And if we do, we'll not only save lives, we'll prevent bankruptcies uh, across the country. In the absence of direct negotiation, American prescription drug prices have gone up year after year, while large drug companies saw huge profit margins of about 20% on average. These price hikes have caused Americans to choose between buying their prescriptions, paying rent, and buying food. For example, one in four diabetes patients report rationing their insulin. 30% uh, of Americans have skipped a medication uh, dose due to cost. The Council on Informed Drug uh, Spending Analysis has estimated that by 2030, 1.1 million Americans will die prematurely due to high out-of-pocket drug costs. Every member of this committee has heard from their constituents about high prescription drug costs. Today, our subcommittee uh, can help them by moving HR3 forward, the Elijah E. Cummings Lower Drug Costs Now Act, uh, obviously named after our beloved um, uh, colleague. HR3 will finally give Medicare the power to negotiate lower drug prices for drugs that have no market competition and extend those lower prices to all Americans. The legislation caps out-of-pocket spending on drugs at $2,000 for Medicare beneficiaries. Today, seniors can pay more than $15,000 a year for a single prescription drug. During our markup of HR3 in 2019, I added a provision uh, to the bill to cap how much seniors with high out-of-pocket costs pay per month to $250. HR3 will also stop drug price hikes, like the ones we saw from EpiPen and Martin uh, Shrikili. If a manufacturer raises the price of a drug, including generics, above the rate of inflation, then the manufacturer must pay the entire price above inflation back to the treasury. Nonpartisan analyses found HR3 will reduce US drug prices for negotiated drugs by 40 to 55% on average, save the federal government and taxpayers $500 billion over 10 years, save patients $158 billion in lower insurance premiums and out-of-pocket costs, and save private businesses $46 billion. With these savings, we can make a major investment to kickstart drug research and development at the NIH, FDA, and the Advanced Research Projects Agency for Health, ARPA-H, which the president described in his address to Congress last week. These investments will support the development of innovative cures that will be available and affordable to all Americans. This bill is popular and it's bipartisan across the country. In an April poll, 93% of Americans support giving Medicare the power to negotiate with drug companies for lower prices. AARP, the American Hospital Association, the American Medical Association, the Purchaser Business Group, and the AFL-CIO all support HR3. A recent poll of executives from 300 large private employers found that 72% agree 
that a stronger government role is needed to negotiate prices for high cost drugs. This bill could be bipartisan. In Congress, there's been bipartisan support for the VA's direct negotiation authority for 30 years. Several provisions at HR3 are similar to the Senate's bipartisan bill from the last Congress. The last Republican president also supported negotiating drug prices, uh, but didn't deliver on it. I think it's time to live up to our promises to lower the cost of prescription drugs for all our constituents. Uh, the chair now recognizes um, Mr. Guthrie, our uh, wonderful ranking member of the subcommittee, for five minutes for his opening statement. Please bring thank you, Chair you. Issue, and thank you for holding this important hearing. I am very concerned about the consequences of Speaker Pelosi's partisan drug bill, HR3, that's before us today. There is no doubt that Congress must do something to lower prescription drug prices. We know the American people want lower prices, but they do not want to sacrifice access to life-changing treatment. HR19, the Lower Cost More Cures Act, that I helped introduce would lower prescription drug costs while protecting innovation for new cures. We also know the American people do not want their Medicare taxes and premiums they pay diverted to liberal PEP programs, which I'm afraid is the direction HR3 is headed. Speaker Pelosi's bill brings us one step closer to single payer healthcare systems. Supporters of single payer often cite healthcare systems around the world as examples of that the US should follow. However, I believe single payer systems are a very dangerous idea. In the United States, we have access to cutting edge, innovative drugs and the brilliant scientists and companies who develop them. The key word here is access. Under HR3, we would be forced to sacrifice this access for more bureaucracy and fewer cures. A partial estimate from CBO said HR3 will result in 15 fewer new drugs developed and the White House Council of Economic Advisors under the previous administration estimated up to 100 fewer drugs. Two years ago, when we first examined HR3, one of our colleagues said in a hearing that he was willing to forfeit the CBO estimated cures that would not be developed due to government price setting. I challenge my colleagues, would you still agree with this statement knowing that one of those for forfeitures could have been the COVID-19 vaccine? Last week, the White House announced that 100 million Americans, almost 40% of U.S. adults have now been fully vaccinated against COVID-19, and 55% of U.S. adults have received at least their first shot. America is in a very different spot than our allies in Europe, who due to their single-payer systems prioritize price over vaccine research and development and innovation. Thanks to President Trump, America took a very diff different approach than our European allies. Through Operation Warp Speed, we partnered with private industry and invested in research and development. We have the results to our approach to prove it. Three safe, effective vaccines rolled out in record time. These vaccines have allowed our country to open and move forward. HR3 disincentivizes, disincentivizes research and development, and had it been in place last year, could have led to a worse outcome for all Americans in the fight against COVID and the race to a viable vaccine. There are bipartisan solutions to lower drug prices, including HR19, the lower cost, more cures act that will level the playing field for American consumers while still allowing for vital innovative innovation that Americans depend on. Just last week, President Biden said in his joint address, and I quote, now if Congress won't pass my plan, let's at least pass something we agree on, unquote. I think that exactly, that's exactly what the American people want us to do. There is room for bipartisan action to lower cost. HR 19 is all bipartisan policies. And I am particularly interested in value-based agreements and Medicare Part D reform. These two areas have strong bipartisan support and would positively impact the lives of millions of Americans. I would like to yield my remaining time to Dr. Burgess. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Um, of course, we did have this debate in October of, of 2019. But as so many of us know, we serve in the, in the People's House. In many ways, this is the People's Committee. And in this committee, we do have a history of working both sides of the dais together for things that are important to the American people. So I certainly appreciate 
throw an issue that HR 19 has been included in the list of policies that we're, we're discussing today because it does include bipartisan drug pricing policy solutions that, uh, in fact, could be signed into law tomorrow. In fact, 17 policies from HR 19 from the last Congress have already been signed into law. And of course, there were several Democrats who voted for HR 19 on the House floor when it was proposed as an alternative to HR 3 in October of 2019. HR 3 did not become law. It did not become law because it is a partisan exercise and will limit patient access to treatments and cures. Parts of HR 19 did become law because they were part bipartisan and they do improve patient access. Let's do what the president has suggested and pass what we can. And Representative Guthrie is exactly right in making that request. And I'll yield back to the gentleman. The gentleman yields back. The now uh, the chair now is uh, pleased to recognize the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Cologne, for his opening statement. Five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman Escher, and thank you for this very important hearing. I really think that health care is still the number one priority uh, for the American people. And within that context, lowering the cost of prescription drugs is the biggest priority. So today we're considering HR3, the Elijah Cummings Lower Cost now, Drug Cost Now Act and other legislation that will provide much needed relief to Americans who are fed up with the outrageously high prices of their prescription drugs. And I'm pleased we're holding this hearing to highlight once again why we must act and why HR3 is the comprehensive solution this country needs to fix our broken market for prescription drugs. For too long, Americans have been forced to ration their medication, go without or exhaust their life savings in order to afford the drugs they need, all while large pharmaceutical companies continue to make record profits. Americans pay three, four, or 10 times the amount that people pay in other countries for the exact same drug. And how is that fair? It's not. In fact, it's outrageous. And it's long past time that we negotiate a better deal for Americans. Now, HR3 gives the Secretary of Health and Human Services the ability to negotiate lower drug prices directly with drug manufacturers on high cost prescription drugs that don't have any competition. The Secretary negotiates lower prices on behalf of Medicare, but those same lower prices will be available to all Americans with private insurance. HR3 also stops unfair and unjustifi unjustified price increases by requiring drug manufacturers to pay a rebate if they increase prices faster than inflation. The bill also caps Part D out-of-pocket costs for Medicare beneficiaries, so they pay no more than $2,000 out of their own pockets a year for their prescription drugs. HR3 provides the reforms we need to lower the cost of prescription drugs and uses some of those savings to reinvest in efforts to find the next scientific breakthroughs at the National Institutes of Health and improve drug review at the FDA. And HR3 will save consumers and taxpayers billions of dollars and it will lower health care costs and premiums while also improving health outcomes. In fact, the Congressional Budget Office estimates that HR3 will reduce drug prices. The estimated cost of health insurance will also be reduced, leading to more take-home pay for workers. CBO also determined that the Medicare program will save $42 billion in other health care expenditures because beneficiaries will be healthier since they'll be able to afford the medication and take them as prescribed. And HR3 will have a tremendous impact on the lives of everyday Americans. People like Teresa or the ball who's going to testify before the committee today, her experience, while unfortunately not unique, encapsulates us so clearly why HR3 must become law. The medication Teresa relied on to treat her multiple sclerosis, as she will tell you, wiped out her savings. Eventually, she was forced to stop taking this medication because of the cost, even though she knew she would face health repercussions as a result. I just don't believe that any American should have to choose between paying for the prescription drugs they need to stay healthy and other basic necessities like food and rent. As President Biden noted last week during his joint address, it's long past time that Americans are no longer saddled with higher drug costs than people in other countries. It's long past time to negotiate lower prescription drug prices for the American people. And I look forward to moving HR3 through, HR3 through the committee once again and for it to become law this year as the president suggested. 
In addition to negotiation and stopping the inflation of drug prices, we also know that competition is key to bringing down costs for Americans. In 2019 alone, patients and the healthcare system saved more than $300 billion due to generic and biosimilar competition. So today, we're also discussing several other bills that will increase competition. And then we'll hear from our witnesses today about finding comprehensive solutions to high drug prices and why that can no longer wait. So I, I'm, I'm pleased that we're considering all these legislative proposals today. And I'd like to yield now a minute to uh, the gentleman from Oregon, uh, Kurt Schrader. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman Plone, for the time to speak today in favor of a couple of bills I have here before the committee. The Biosim Act is a common sense approach to increasing the utilization of biosimilars in this country. As we'll hear today, biologic injectable drugs are very expensive and increasing the use of generic biosimilar forms will decrease patient costs. The Blocking Act is also a market-based reform to ensure generic competition in the drug marketplace to decrease costs to patients. In the current system, some generic manufacturers delay bringing their drugs to market by parking their applications once being awarded exclusivity. Doing so blocks other generic drugs that are actually ready from coming to the market and delays these less expensive drugs for reaching our patients. The rising cost of drug prices is deeply impacting all Americans it's time to move forward with policies of broad support, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, thank him for his work. Uh, I would just add a source of pride to me is uh, that I was the author of, uh, of the biosimilars legislation. Uh, so thank you. Uh, the chair now recognizes uh, the ranking member of the full committee, uh, Representative Kathy McMorris-Rogers, uh, for your five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chair, and to our witnesses for joining us today. The story of American innovation is one that should be celebrated, bringing hope and early access to the most life-saving, life-changing treatments in the world. In the case of Crystal Davis, who will share her, her story today, it saved her son's life after doctors diagnosed him with spinal muscular atrophy with no chance of survival. Crystal and parents like her who have a child with a rare disease, they are fighting for the promise for the next life changing cure and treatment. I'm certain that we've all heard stories before from caregivers and patient advocates like Crystal. We've listened to people who want a fighting chance at life. That fighting chance came with the American way, freedom and opportunity. Take Alzheimer's for example. We need major breakthroughs to transfer transform how we treat this disease and slow its progression. It would lift one of today's biggest costs and care burdens on both families and our healthcare system. It's more than just hope. Whether it's a rare disease like SMA, cancer, or Alzheimer's, or another dementia, new cures and treatments are a very real possibility if we can protect and spur the private investment for more discoveries. That brings me to Speaker Pelosi's government price control scheme before us today. It's a false choice, forcing us to jeopardize cures and breakthroughs in the name of saving money. According to CBO experts and other uh, of the speaker's own colleagues, it would result in dozens of fewer cures. Last Congress, the White House Council of Economic Advisors said it would lead to as many of 100 fewer drugs over the next decade. What could one of these cures or treatments mean? We don't know, but we know that if this becomes law, we'd lose hope to cure cancer or treat generic conditions. We become more reliant on China. And then if those discoveries are even made at all, we'd be reliant on a federal bureaucrat, someone in Washington DC to let us have it. Like in Canada, the UK or other countries, the power would rest with the federal government to crudely measure lives in dollars and cents. I just heard about a family in Canada. They have two boys, both with cystic fibrosis. Their 10 year old has his medications. For their younger son, they're forced to painfully beg the government for his treatment. At first, the government just said no. Now they're being told their eight year old son must drop 20% of his lung function within a six month period. The mom said he has to become really sick to qualify. She said, quote, I compare it to waiting for a person to go on a ventilator before you give them the COVID vaccine. 
waiting for a person to reach stage four cancer before you treat them with chemo. There's nothing just about a system like this. It discriminates against people with disabilities and chronic illnesses, the pre-existing conditions, those with pre-existing conditions. The National Council on Disabilities has warned us about the approach that's laid out by Speaker Pelosi, that it's harmful, it's discriminatory, and it will be harmful on the most vulnerable. Unfortunately, this is the socialist healthcare system and the future that Speaker Pelosi is imposing upon us. Instead of price controls, we should focus on areas for bipartisan work. We agree, seniors and patients are paying too much out of pocket. Let's address that. We've seen the benefit of innovation in the fight against COVID-19. Now more than ever, we should be working together on American solutions, uniquely American solutions that save lives, lower costs, and uphold the dignity and the right of every person to live a full life. Energy and commerce can lead the way. We've plowed the hard ground with the bipartisan proposals in the Lower Cost More Tears Act to build unity, deliver results. President Biden signed three of these provisions already into law this year. President Trump signed 16 into law last Congress. Let's not let Speaker Pelosi's government price control scheme jeopardize the work to lower seniors' out-of-pocket costs. Let's do what's right for moms like Crystal, representing millions of moms, not just for hope, but for real life-saving solutions too. With that, I yield back. General, gentlewoman yields back. Uh, the chair uh, reminds members uh, that pursuant to committee rules, uh, all members' written opening statements will be made part of the record. I now would like to introduce our witnesses. First, Ms. Therese Ball is a registered, is a retired registered nurse from Ogden Dunes, Indiana. She's a multiple sclerosis patient and a Medicare beneficiary. Welcome and thank you uh, for testifying today. Uh, Mr. Michael Carrier is a distinguished professor of law from Rutgers Law School, and we welcome you back to the subcommittee, Mr. Carrier. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Gaurav uh, Gupta is the founder of Ascendant BioCapital. Uh, welcome to the committee, and thank you for being with us. Uh, Ms. Crystal Davis is a rare disease caregiver, a patient advocate, and the founding president of the Texas Rare Alliance. Welcome and thank you to you. Uh, and last but not least, Ms. Rachel Sachs. Uh, she's an associate professor of law at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, and that is the, the School of Law. Welcome to you and thank you for being with us. Uh, so Ms. Ball, uh, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, please remember to unmute. And um, thank you again for being willing to testify before our subcommittee today. Chairwoman Ishu, Ranking Member Guthrie, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to share my story. My name is Therese Ball, and I am a proud grandmother and retired registered nurse from Ogden Dunes, Indiana. I am here as a person living with multiple sclerosis, a Medicare beneficiary, and a patient advocate. I've dedicated my life to taking care of patients because of my nursing training, I've provided medical care and alleviated suffering for thousands of patients. But nursing school did not prepare me for the suffering I saw when my patients could not afford needed treatment. I had a front row seat to the horrifying reality of our drug pricing system. Drugs don't work if people can't afford them. I never thought I'd be one of those struggling patients until 2003 when I was diagnosed with MS and prescribed a medication called Capaxone. Let me tell you about Capaxone. The drug came to market in 1997 at a price of $769 a month. Today, that same monthly supply costs $7,114, almost 10 times higher. The drug company that makes it, Tivu, accomplished this by hiking the price 27 times over two decades. This pattern was not mirrored in other countries. By 2015, the price of Capaxon was on average five times higher in the United States than in other comparable nations. I faced these prices firsthand when I began taking Capaxone. 
It cost me $1,800 a month. And within a year, it completely wiped out my savings. It was devastating. Fortunately, I was able to find a grant from an independent charity, but I lived in fear that I might lose access. That day came in 2017 when the foundation did not renew my grant. At that point, Capaxone had increased in price to $6,000 a month. I was completely overwhelmed by this price tag. And no matter how many times I crunched the numbers, I couldn't make it work. So I made the terrifying decision to go without the drug. The health consequences were immediate and severe. I lost my memory and my quality of life suffered tremendously. My family began making preparations for when I no longer would be able to walk or live independently. Eventually, my doctor switched me to an infusion that I am fortunate to be able to afford through Medicare. But MS is a progressive disease, and I know I will continue to need different and likely very expensive medications. And one day, I hope there will be a cure for MS, which is why I understand the importance of innovation. Drug companies have taken this idea of innovation, this hope, and turned it into an ultimatum for patients. They say we must let them charge whatever prices they want, or we can say farewell to future cures, but that's a false choice. Expert research has demonstrated that brand name drug companies could lose one trillion in sales over 10 years and still be the most profitable industry in the United States. Drug companies spend billions each year on TV ads and lobbying. They can more than afford to cut prices while maintaining their investment in research and development. We don't have to settle for a false choice we can have more affordable drugs and meaningful innovation, innovation at the same time. Affordable drugs are more important now than ever. The COVID-19 pandemic has not just devastated the financial well-being of millions of people, it also continues to increase the number of people with chronic disease who will now rely on expensive medications. I know this because last year I had COVID-19. The infection was so destructive to my lung tissues then now I have to take an expensive inhaler called Brio, adding to my already steep monthly drug cost. Members of the committee, today you are considering a bill called HR3. This bill would end the ban on Medicare negotiation and help beneficiaries like me by instituting a cap on what we pay out of pocket. In addition, the lower prices achieved through negotiation would be extended to everyone, regardless of what insurance they have today. You have an opportunity to bring relief to me and millions of other Americans struggling to afford our needed medications. As you consider this legislation, please remember our stories. I can't control my disease or change that I have MS, but telling you my story and advocating for lower drug prices is something I can control. Thank you. And I urge you to vote in support of HR3. Patients have waited long enough. Thank you, Ms. Ball, for being with us to uh, tell your story. Uh, Mr. Carrier, thank you again for being with us. Uh, you're now recognized for your five minutes uh, of testimony. Great. Thank you so much, Chairwoman Eshoo, Ranking Member Guthrie, members of this subcommittee. Drug prices are too high. And one main reason why is that brand companies play all sorts of games to delay generic entry. Today, I'm going to focus my comments on two pay for delay settlements, and citizen petitions. This conduct makes no sense at all other than harming the generic. And if there were legislation that were passed, it would not affect innovation at all, but it would make consumers' lives better. My name is Michael Carrier. I'm a distinguished professor at Rutgers Law School, where I focus on the intersection of antitrust and intellectual property. I'm a co-author of the leading treatise in the field on antitrust and IP. I've written 130 articles on this, and I frequently file briefs with courts. So the first type of conduct that this subcommittee can address is pay for delay settlements. Sometimes a brand company pays a generic to stay off the market. Now in 2013, the Supreme Court in a case called FTC v. Activist said that these settlements could have anti-competitive effects and could violate the antitrust laws. So after that decision, we saw that the number of pay for delay settlements went down, but there still are pay for delay settlements and the parties still have every interest to muddy the waters, 
to raise arguments that were rejected in activists and to try to continue to engage in these settlements. And so the legislation at issue here, H.R. 153 and H.R. 19, would address these real problems. First, it would allow the FTC to bring these cases in court. It's very hard when the brand company is paying the generic not in cash, but in these increasingly complicated deals for the FTC to figure that all out. So this takes years and years and costs millions of dollars in litigation. And so first, in order to give the FTC a, a chance to win this stuff in court before a decade or two goes by, the legislation would be incredibly helpful. And second, the legislation would fix some of these judicial mistakes. Sometimes courts don't apply activists the way that they were supposed to. Sometimes they fail to recognize a payment. Sometimes they say that entry before the end of the patent term is automatically okay, even though the Supreme Court explicitly rejected that argument in activists. And so the second reason why settlement legislation is so important is to fix some of these mistakes in the court. So at the end of the day, I'm a big supporter of H.R. 153 and H.R. 19, which would make patients' lives better without touching innovation. Second, I'd like to talk about citizen petitions. Citizen petitions are designed to raise legitimate safety concerns with the FDA, but in reviewing every petition filed between 2001 and 2015, I found that most of these petitions actually are filed just to delay the generic. And the FDA actually denies most of these, 92% of them, 98% at the last minute. These petitions are filed just to delay generic competition. So what can this committee do? H.R. 2387, the Stop Games Act of 2019, would provide at least four benefits in stopping these frivolous citizen petitions. First, it would make sure that the FDA has a summary disposition power to get rid of these frivolous petitions without spending so much time on them. Technically, they have this power right now, but it is so difficult to satisfy that the FDA has never used the power at all. And so opening that up, as this legislation does, would be an excellent start. Second, it sheds light on what a primary purpose of delay is. When you look at all these petitions and you see the recurring themes of delayed petitions and repetitive petitions and one filed at the last minute, you see a bunch of themes. And so if you take all of those facts and weave them into the primary purpose of delay, then that helps all parties in stopping this conduct. Third, there is a time limit. You can't find out about this petition and then wait for five years as Milan did with an EpiPen citizen petition. You have to file it within a finite period of time. And fourth, there is more information that the FDA needs to provide to Congress. So when you think about the fact that we don't know the petitions that are filed, how much delay actually happens from these petitions, more information into this black box would be incredibly helpful. So at the end of the day, the legislation on pay for delay settlements and citizen petitions would not touch innovation in the slightest, but it would make consumers' lives better. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Carrier. Uh, the chair is now pleased to recognize Dr. Gupta. Thank you for being with us. Uh, you are now recognized for your five minutes for your testimony. Chairman Manashu, Ranking Member Guthrie, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on HR3 and the deleterious effect it would have on biopharma innovation and on patients. Let there be no doubt that we are living at the dawn of a golden age of therapeutic innovation. The first FDA approvals of oligonucleotide, bispecific, oncolytic virus, CAR-T, and AAV and lentiviral gene therapy all took place within the last decade. Novel small molecule drugs have cured thousands of Americans of hepatitis C, added decades to the lifespan of patients with cystic fibrosis, and positively impacted the lives of patients with sickle cell disease, while immunotherapies have transformed the lives of patients with cancer. Promising technologies such as targeted protein degradation and gene editing are perhaps not far behind. Future rewards will be greater still if we preserve our current system of incentivizing innovation. America is the global epicenter of accelerated drug development. 57% of all new medicines are invented by U.S. companies. The bulk of the remainder are developed by foreign companies in and for the U.S. market. An indirect benefit of this is that most novel therapeutics undergo clinical development and early commercial launch here in the U.S. The rest of the world understands that the American patient has earlier and broader access to groundbreaking therapies via these mechanisms. 
The scientific literature is unequivocal about the improved health outcomes generated from pharmaceutical purchasing. The 1.4% of GDP we currently spend on branded medications incentivizes future research and development and ensures that the global center of gravity of the pharma industry remains here in the U.S., where our citizens can enjoy the fruits of early access. On top of that, the biopharma industry's economic output in 2017 was estimated at $1.1 trillion, and the sector employed over 800,000 workers, one-third in key STEM occupations. It is undeniable that our healthcare system does not equally distribute innovations, with high out-of-pocket costs presenting barriers to medication access for many Americans. Insurance companies, pharmacies, and pharmacy benefit managers, PBMs, all sit between a medication and the patient who needs it. An incredibly confusing system of discounts and rebates obscures how much money goes to manufacturers and how much goes to middlemen. Actions to improve access to medications and reduce out-of-pocket costs for patients are long overdue. We can achieve these goals while preserving America's unique capacity for innovation. I'd like to contextualize pharmaceutical spending to other cost drivers in the healthcare system. The growth in overall national health expenditure is predominantly attributed to hospital spending. Branded drugs account for only 8% of the total. Our expenditure on prescription drugs encompasses not only what is paid to pharma companies, but also what is paid out of the system to middlemen. I would submit to the committee that a good faith effort to meaningfully curb healthcare spending demands addressing both the largest drivers, hospitals, and hidden costs, the prescription drug middlemen. In the context of prescription drugs, the very existence of -of out-of-pocket costs doesn't make sense. No patient gets a medication without a doctor prescribing it, and often insurance plans require that the doctor seek explicit prior authorization. It doesn't follow that insurance companies, having agreed that a patient needs a particular medicine based on FDA labeling for that product, then ask a patient to put skin in the game by paying a portion of the cost. They have skin in the game, their disease. Insurance reforms that cap or even eliminate out-of-pocket costs, not just in Medicare Part D, but also for Americans who receive coverage through their employers, through healthcare exchanges, and other types of health plans, would be a high-impact step towards ensuring broad access. The critical flaw of HR3 is that it conflates drug prices and patient out-of-pocket costs. Importing foreign pricing would only marginally reduce what patients with high deductible plans, including Medicare, are forced to pay. It wouldn't solve their problem. What it would do is dramatically undermine the ability of American biotech companies to develop innovative medicines that could treat and cure innumerable diseases in the future. I'd like to conclude with a point about American competitiveness. The ability for parts of today's hearing to take place in person was made possible by the whirlwind development of vaccines and monoclonal antibodies for COVID-19. And this innovation capacity ought to be a source of national pride. My perception as a biotechnology professional is that other countries are eager to siphon our pharmaceutical prowess, particularly China, which has made biotech a strategic pillar. In 2016, the market capitalization of all Chinese biopharma companies was $1 billion. Only five years later, the combined market cap of all Chinese biopharma companies is north of $200 billion. In 2019, for the first time ever, a drug developed in China was approved by the US FDA. When I speak to Chinese biotechnology executives and Chinese physicians, they boast that they can run clinical trials faster than their U.S. counterparts. The danger of HR3 is that it will effectively drive biotech innovation to China. If we close off the market in the U.S., while China is opening their market to innovative new products, we will see companies launching impactful novel medicines in China based on clinical trials conducted in China. In order for patients to be able to buy American, we have to protect America's capacity to be a home for innovation. Let's continue to nurture this important work on our soil. Thank you. The gentleman yields back and we thank you for your testimony. Uh, The uh, chair now recognizes uh, Ms. Davis for your five minutes of uh, testimony and we thank you again for being with us. Chairwoman Eshu, Ranking Member Guthrie and distinguished members, I am privileged to be here today as a rare disease parent, caregiver and patient advocate to share my perspective and represent the one in 10 Americans affected by more than 7,000 rare diseases. I founded Texas Rare Alliance to improve access and health outcomes for nearly 3 million Texas rare disease patients. That's a large number and it is correct. More Americans have rare disease than HIV, heart disease or stroke combined. And 95% of rare diseases lack an treatment. We know what happens to patients in other countries referenced by HR3. They get worse access to treatments because the lives of people with rare diseases and disabled people are undervalued. In 2011, our newborn son lost nearly all movement at two weeks of age. At one point, my husband asked if I had shaken Hunter. I could never hurt our baby, but he was hurting. When doctors diagnosed our newborn with SMA, our world changed forever. 
SMA is like ALS and babies. It robs the ability to move, swallow, and ultimately breathe, and is the number one genetic cause of death from infants. Doctors told us there was no treatment and no hope, but we couldn't afford to listen. The stakes were too high. With the help of a researcher, we manufactured a compound in the U.S. and took it to Mexico for a trial. Eight weeks after his diagnosis, Hunter was the first SMA patient to receive a life-saving treatment. Nearly five years later, Hunter and his friend Ben started the Spinraza Expanded Access Program together. Soon after, the FDA approved Spinraza, the first SMA treatment. Upon FDA approval, insurers developed policies for Spinraza. Both Hunter and Ben were insured by United. Hunter met the Spinraza inclusion criteria. However, Ben failed to meet it because he depends on a machine to breathe for him. Ben's mom, Melissa, and I cried. She asked why Ben wasn't worth saving too. Ben was worth saving, but I couldn't change the policy. Biogen covered Ben in a patient assistance program until he secured a Medicaid waiver providing Spinraza. ICER evaluated Spinraza according, scoring SMA patients a 0.2 determining its cost was not affected. effective. We already have, we're already advocating against the use of ICER's qualities. Adopting reference pricing that incorporates discriminatory qualities undermines our advocacy efforts. We know CBO scored HR3 assuming the use of qualities to set prices relied on by foreign countries. The NCD shared their concerns with the committee on HR3 and its implications for discrimination. At one point during the pandemic, we moved back to our St. Louis home after learning of quality-based medical rationing in Austin. We knew St. Louis Children's Hospital valued Hunter and worked to save his lives many times. This should provide some context for why I oppose HR3. The burden study by the Every Life Foundation found indirect and non-medical costs accounted for nearly 60% of overall costs to rare disease families, with prescription medications accounting for only 10%. We can't expect to address affordability if we're focusing on such a small percentage of the problem. Rare disease parents work hard to keep our children alive. We become medical experts providing a standard of care at home exceeding care at hospitals. That's not a smug statement. When our children are in the hospital, we don't leave their side. We know the standard of care for their rare disease, and we know if the hospital follows the protocol for a child of typical health, our children would be harmed and might not survive. We manage machines that feed, breathe for, or monitor our babies and children. We give them medicine to, and do their treatments. We don't get time off because the rare diseases our children fight against never take time off. Doctors tell us there's no hope, but we have more than hope. We have unconditional love for our children and we refuse to give up on them. We value every breath they take and we dare not take a single breath for granted. HR3 would also greatly reduce research and development of rare disease treatments. We don't see approvals coming from those countries. They're innovation deserts, a cruel place when you need innovative treatments to survive. Research and development are the stuff dreams are made of. We hold bake sales, runs, parties, and pretty much anything we can think of to fund research. The thing is our funds only get researchers so far. Without follow-on funding from the NIH, biotech companies, or biopharmaceutical companies, the research stalls. At the current pace, it will take thousands of years to secure treatments for all rare diseases. Meanwhile, a third of children with rare disease will not survive to their fifth birthday. Research for rare diseases can move with the same relentless urgency as COVID-19 research. We must respect and value the lives of medically fragile, disabled, and elderly individuals. We cannot afford to stop opposing HR3. We refuse to save our children only to have a system adopt qualities that give up on them. Thank you. Thank you. Um very much, Ms. Davis. Uh, the chair now recognizes Ms. Sachs uh, for your five minutes for testimony. And thank you again for being with us. Thank you. Chairwoman Eshoo, Ranking Member Guthrie, and other distinguished members of the Health Subcommittee of the House Committee on Energy and Commerce. My name is Rachel Sachs, and I'm an Associate Professor of Law at Washington University in St. Louis, where my research focuses on innovation and access to new pharmaceuticals. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today about the high prices of prescription drugs and how this committee might help solve these problems. My testimony will explain why comprehensive prescription drug pricing reform should include three types of policy solutions. First, reform should lower patients' out-of-pocket costs. Second, reform should fix misaligned incentives in our existing pharmaceutical pricing system. And third, reform should address the underlying problem of high drug prices. There is no single way to accomplish each of these three goals, 
and different countries have chosen different answers to each of them. But HR 3 pulls all three of these policy levers to lower drug prices. Other congressional proposals do not. Today, prescription drug prices in the United States are high and rising. Individual drug prices are rising. Between 2018 and 2019, pharmaceutical companies raised the list prices of half of all Part D drugs faster than inflation. System-wide spending is also rising. Between 2007 and 2017, Part D spending rose from 46.2 to 79.9 billion. Part B spending rose from 15.4 billion in 2009 to 35 billion in 2018. These dynamics create challenges for patients. About one in four people report difficulty affording their medications, and they may respond by rationing their medication or by delaying filling prescriptions. Patients have died as a result of these impossible choices. A large bipartisan majority of Americans believes that prescription drug costs are unreasonable. This committee has an important role to play in responding to the problem of high prescription drug prices in three key areas. First, Limiting patients' out-of-pocket costs is necessary to relieve the financial pressures facing many patients. Today, there is no cap on Medicare Part D beneficiaries' out-of-pocket costs, and 1.1 million Part D beneficiaries have out-of-pocket spending above the catastrophic threshold. H.R. 3 addresses this problem by imposing a cap on Part D out-of-pocket costs. This committee might also consider additional policy reforms to accomplish this goal. For instance, as the National Academies has recommended, Congress might authorize CMS to limit patients' cost sharing for classes of drugs where treatment adherence can reduce total care costs. Proposals in this category would help millions of patients who have difficulty affording their medications. But lowering patients' out-of-pocket costs in isolation could even increase financial burdens on other patients and on Medicare. So these reforms ought to be paired with others, which would directly address prescription drug prices. Second, our existing system for paying for prescription drugs creates incentives for actors to drive prices up rather than down over time. HR 3 includes two key elements to fix these misaligned incentives. It requires drug manufacturers who raise the prices of their drugs more rapidly than inflation to pay rebates back to Medicare, as Medicaid already requires. And its Part D benefit redesign gives both manufacturers and Part D plans greater incentives to manage price and formulary designs. There are many other examples of incentives this committee should consider addressing, including some of the often criticized business practices of pharmacy benefit managers. These attempts to address misaligned incentives are important, but they would not fundamentally address the underlying high prices of these drugs either. So third and finally, this committee should consider reforms that would strengthen Medicare's negotiating authority and increase the likelihood that our public payers can obtain fair prices for these products. H.R. 3 addresses this issue by providing the Secretary of HHS the authority to negotiate with the manufacturers of select high price drugs. To facilitate this negotiation, H.R. 3 uses international reference pricing, creating an average international market price across six countries as the basis for a target fair price in negotiations. There are many different ways of constructing an effective drug price negotiation system, and H.R. 3 offers just one potential example. Several of the countries included in HR 3s market basket provide examples of this and other approaches. This committee has the ability to help solve the problem of high drug prices, not only for patients, but also for our public payers. Chairwoman Eshoo, Ranking Member Guthrie, members of the committee, I'm appreciative of your focus on this important issue. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much uh, for your testimony. Uh, and now uh, we're going to move to member questions, and um, I will recognize myself for five minutes uh, for mine. First, uh, to Ms. Ball, uh, thank you for being willing to share your story. It's a, uh, it's a very powerful one, um, as well as uh, your work as a, uh, as a registered nurse. Uh, in your testimony, you said that uh, the uh, MS drug uh, Capaxon uh, went from costing you $1,800 a month to $6,000 a month. Was yes. there any innovation that changed that drug between 2003 and 2017 to account for the price change? No, actually, there was no innovation. It um, What had happened was they um, raised the price 27 times, but what they did was 
they had a new one brought out in 2015, 2014. So you usually with Capaxone, you do seven injections, right? One a day. They brought a new one out that was um, the 40 milligram. And what it did was it made it easier. You only did it three times a day. So I every, see. You know, mm -hmm. it, it right. sold it to the, comp the um, physicians and to the others. But right. Actually, were there, excuse me. Were there other countries that saw comparable price hikes uh, to that drug during that time? Do you know? Um, yes, the, but they pay um, less than we do, even with that, because they negotiate all their drugs. So uh, was it is uh, Capaxin the uh, your only option? Does it have any market competition? It really doesn't. The only thing it had was is that when it came up to do the forty milligrams they were starting to lose their abilities to, um, you know, patent it and everything. So that's why they redid it. It did not change anything. But there's no evidence that it improved. And okay. It also uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Gupta, uh, uh, thank you again for being with us today. Uh, I'd like to ask you the following question. Uh, you've heard uh, Ms. Ball's story. It, it's a powerful <laughs> one. It covers uh, a range of issues relative to... Uh, a pricing, uh, a drug that has no competition, uh, the price hikes uh, over X number of years, and that how that has impacted her life. It's a story of many people in our country. Specifically, what can you say to her? I mean, you you hold your view, which I respect, but what what would you say to uh, Miss Ball? What do you have to offer to her? Thank you, Congresswoman, and and. Ms. Ball, it, 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 I was moved by your story, of course. You know, I would, I'm a physician as well uh, as a biotechnology investor. Mm -hmm. And I can assure you that, um, you know, having, having moved, you know, over to the biotechnology industry, I'm impressed every day with the, the, the passion and the tenacity of the, the folks in our industry and their commitment mm -hmm. to patients first and foremost. And at the core mm -hmm. of everything we do, we know patients are waiting. And that's why it's frustrating um, when patients don't have access to drugs. And, and you know, Ms. Ball, from, from my understanding, you know, the out-of-pocket costs were particularly a barrier for you. Um, and I think that, you know, from our perspective, we, we agree there. I mean, you know, it, um, we, the data is unequivocal. It's just a $10 increase in out-of-pocket cost by insurers has been shown to increase mortality by 33% for some patients. And these are easy fixes. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I would say that we can find common ground and make it easier to access medications for all patients. Okay. I, I have, uh, we all have limited time and I appreciate your uh, directing some of your comments to her. Uh, to uh, Ms. Sachs, uh, as a lawyer, are there any uh, provisions in HR3 that would keep Medicare from continuing to cover all the drugs that it does today? And are there any provisions in your view in HR3 that would limit patient choices? Thank you for the question. This is such an important one. And as you know, access is at the heart of HR3. By making it easier for patients to afford their medications, it will increase access to them. And nothing in HR3 disrupts any of Medicare's requirements to cover drugs, including in the six protected classes. Mm -hmm. I also want to make a very brief uh, clarification about what we mean when we talk about access. What we mean is that a pharmaceutical company would rather pull their drug from the American market than charge us the same prices or even a premium that they're already charging in other countries and at which we know they make a profit. So when we talk about access, we're talking about choices that the pharmaceutical company is making, not Medicare. Thank you. Uh, I think my time has um, just about expired. Uh, and a, a reminder to all mem uh, to all of the witnesses uh, that members will have uh, the opportunity to submit questions to each one of you, our written questions. And uh, uh, we ask that uh, you respond and answer them uh, in a um, uh, in a reasonable time frame. Uh, so the chair will now recognize, uh, let's see, uh, I, uh, I think that uh, I'm going to recognize uh, per our agreement, Mr. Guthrie, to recognize Mr. McKinley. Uh, and uh, welcome to the subcommittee, Mr. McKinley. And uh, you have five minutes to ask your questions. 
And uh, we hope and pray that your wife's uh, surgery, that's my understanding, um, goes well. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Anna. Uh, and thank you for the chance, opportunity, this chance to, for you uh, to give me that chance to get back to the hospital, be with her. Uh, and for rank, and, and for uh, ranking uh, Guthrie, I, I appreciate it. Uh, um, look, we all know there's a need for drug pricing reform. We all, I don't think there's any one of us would be arguing against that. But pursuing this uh, highly partisan HR3 uh, is just an example of overreach, un unfortunate overreach. It occurs too often in Washington and it gets in the way. Uh, all the political observers that, that I've read about in Washington uh, in the press are saying that HR3 is not going to pass the Senate. Uh, so I, I've got to say fundamentally, I, I say, why are we doing this? Why aren't we working together to try to pass something that can be signed into law? Uh, so uh, we, there are bipartisan solutions that were included in HR 19. Uh, so unless we unless we change the course, this projection of this legislation, we know how the story is going to pan out. We've seen it before in immigration. We've seen, we're, we're about to see it in the infrastructure bill again, uh, overreach on that. And we're seeing it now in this drug pricing. These are all bipartisan issues that we would all work together on uh, if we focused on what we need to get done. Focus on those. Uh, but that's not what's happening with this. Uh, look, we were we were here to get solutions to it, and, and I really want to get to it. H HR three, unfortunately, is an overreach, uh, and I'm, I'm, unfortunately, it gives me the impression for those uh, in the public that Congress is seemingly willing to let American patients suffer. This is a high stakes political game we're into right now, and if the Senate doesn't pass it and it doesn't get to the president's desk for signature. The American public is going to suffer. I think they deserve better. H.R. 19 includes caps for insulin deductibles. It, it, it passes on rebates directly to state Medicaid programs, ensuring that PBMs do not profit off government programs. And it makes it unlawful for pay for delay practices whereby drug companies enter agreements with generics and biosimilar manufacturers to delay a competing drug coming to market. These are all obvious. These, these are just a sampling of the 40 bipartisan bills that we already passed out of our committee. So we know that the, the loser here is going to be the American public if we don't get a bill to the president's desk for signature. So I want it with my, my question is now, we know that utilizing generic medication is one of the best way to lower drug pricing. But PBMs and Part D program plans are not covering generics. So, and this practice costs seniors four billion dollars. Insurance have four billion dollars annually. So, Ms. Sachs, in your testimony, you discussed some of these issues about the formulary design in Part D. The current system incentivizes uh, placement of higher cost drug brand pr prices over generics. And the bill that I'm working with Kuster about, uh, 2846, addresses this issue by ensuring would lower the price. Can you speak more to this issue of formulary design and how the current trend is, is leading to increased costs for patients rather than lowering? Yes, absolutely. So without going too far into the details of the Part D benefit design, as this committee is well aware, the current incentives, unfortunately, may lead both manufacturers and PBMs and plans to increase or drive up prices over time rather than to reduce them. And so the Part D redesign elements in HR3 and also in HR19 are important for minimizing some of those incentives. However, they only work where there are generic or biosimilar opportunities available for patients. And in many of these cases, there are not. So in my testimony, I also give the example of a drug like Humira, which was first approved in 2002 and has lively biosimilar competition in Europe, but where we still have no competition today and won't for another two years. Yet it's one of the top 10 selling drugs in Part D. The idea that we would negotiate the price of a drug like Humira and be able to obtain better prices for patients and our payers is at the heart of HR3, 
but it's not part of HR 19. If, if I could get back, I, I want to ask that last question to, to Dr. Gupta, uh, because the United States, we're still across this country, still experiencing a wave of drug overdoses uh, at, at a higher rate than we've ever seen before. Uh, so my question, Dr. It, with, would, how would HR 3 affect the price and discovery of new non-addictive pain medication uh, and treatment assisted assisted medically assisted treatments. How would that, how would HR3 affect that? Can you share some of your thoughts? Thank, thank you, Congressman. Yes. So I think the, uh, the, 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 uh, the need for developing non-opiate, non-addicting pain medications is one that the entire biopharma industry is, is, is working hard to tackle. You know, we're aware of uh, both the need um, for, for treating pain, but also the need of uh, creating alternatives to opiates. Um, it's early stages still. There's there's novel, there's several things in in uh, development that uh, we don't know if they're going to work yet. And I would caution that um, uh, price controls, um, which by the way, you know, don't ensure that we'll be passing savings directly onto patients, uh, would really um, put a lot of that work at risk. Uh, okay, so thank thank you. I've, I've, I'm, my time's expired, and I just want to say, to Aunt, Anna and and and, and Brett, thank you. Uh, I want to be with my wife. So God bless Absolutely, you. and we want you to, uh, Mr. McKinley, I will keep her in my prayers. Thank, Thank you. you. Godspeed. Uh, the chair uh, now re uh, recognizes the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Pallone, for your five minutes of questions. Thank you, Chairwoman Eshu. I'm going to get right to a question to Ms. Ball, and then I'm going to try to get a few into Professor Sachs. So I'm trying to ask you if you can, you know, limit your remarks. Ms. Bull, can you tell this committee in your words why Congress must take action to give Medicare the power to negotiate drug prices and why this task is so urgent and how it will make an impact on the lives of individuals like yourselves who are struggling with the, with the high cost of prescription drugs? Yes, thank you for asking. Um, the question you have asked is how it would help me. It would help me because when you um, lower the price of the drugs, then it is more affordable to people and they will be able to um, get the drugs with the, out the, um, the HR3 that not only takes care of lowering the drug prices is most important because even though the cap is at 2000, we have right now on a Part D drug is 15,000. So if we can do both, reduce the, the medication prices, and also maintain the um, cap, it's going to help us 100%. There's too many people going without because of the fact that it's so expensive. Thank you. Now, I, I think we all recognize that we must act and we have to acknowledge it all, but we should also acknowledge that not all drug pricing legislation is the same and not all policies are equally effective. There are a number of proposals we're considering today uh, that do not include uh, the goal of negotiating prices or the inflation rebate that's in HR3. And I strongly believe that we need to act immediately on HR3 because it offers a comprehensive approach. Uh, so let me go to Professor Sachs, three questions. Uh, as you briefly mentioned in your testimony, can you discuss why reforming the Part D benefit and capping out-of-pocket costs in Part D while critical in conjunction with other policies on its own is not sufficient to actually reduce prices? Yes. So although capping out-of-pocket costs is important to help patients, it doesn't actually lower prices or spending. It just moves money around in the system. MedPAC projected that lowering patients' out-of-pocket costs could even increase overall premiums a little bit and increase Medicare spending as a subsidy for those premiums. So although it's important to reduce out-of-pocket costs, that needs to be coupled with other reforms, which would directly address those high prices. And can you explain how the different titles of HR3 work in tandem and why in order to effectively lower prices, we have to use more than one approach to deliver real savings? Yes. So the restructuring of the Part D benefit is critical to help seniors afford the cost of their prescription drugs. But because it just moves money around in the system, the other titles are also important. So the inflationary rebate provisions as a pillar of HR3 extend to Medicare, a strategy that's worked well in Medicaid to control price increases in that program and should discourage companies 
from raising the prices of their drugs, as we've heard about with Capaxone. But even that won't fundamentally address the underlying high prices of these drugs or the government's lack of negotiating leverage. And that's where the negotiation element of HR3 comes in. So particularly for specialty drugs with little or no competition, HR3 strengthens Medicare's negotiating authority and enables our public payers to obtain more fair prices for these products. And then lastly, my understanding is that HR 19, this is the Republican alternative uh, that we're considering today, does not establish a negotiation framework, nor does it contain the inflation rebate provisions that are included in HR 3. Given that, is HR 19 effective at reducing drug prices? And if not, why not? That's a correct description of HR 19, precisely because. HR 19 is centered around only the restructuring of the Part D benefit. It's unlikely to save our system very much money. So it would certainly help seniors with their out-of-pocket costs, but it has no answer for the company who raises the prices of Capaxone. I believe we heard 27 times in a decade from 700 to 7,000. Uh, that would not be addressed in something like HR 19, and it might even increase premiums for seniors and government spending overall. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, the gentleman yields back. It's a pleasure to recognize the uh, ranking member of our subcommittee, uh, Mr. Guthrie, for your five minutes of questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. I really appreciate it. And this is a, a very valuable hearing. I, I think we're seeing there's a lot that we agree on. I agree with a lot of what Professor, almost all of what Professor Kerry said, uh, a lot of what Prof Professor Sachs has said. Um, we want to put together real, real answers and maybe answer the president's call. Let's pass what we can agree on. And, and I will agree with what Mrs. Ball said. And I think uh, Chair Daggett and I, when we were in the, when I was in ONI, looked at insulin, we have, uh, long existing therapeutics that increase faster than inflation. And that's something I think we need to look at why that's moving forward. And I think the number one is to get competitors into the marketplace. And uh, matter of fact, last week, I think uh, Representative Schrader was in the Oval Office. I was in Kentucky getting a bill signed about dealing with patents and, and, and the way that people gain patents. So there are ways to move forward with this. You know, we're talking about negotiating negotiation and, and the way this bill's kind of structure is more price setting. That that's our concern, not just negotiating. It's the way the price setting mechanism looks forward. And I think it was quoted that 93% of the people support negotiating or, or essentially lower drug prices. But I've seen similar polling to say if you ask at the expense of access to life-saving therapeutics, that that drops. And I can't imagine what the what it would be if, if savings in Medicare and Medi Medicare would be used as a pay for for some other uh, type of issues. But the assumption in HR3 to me is you can change this. Is, I'm going to get to Dr. Gupta. Gupta, you can change how you pay for a product without changing how what you receive and what you get. And, and that's the concern. You know, President Biden in the joint session kept talking about foreign payments uh, and the way foreign payment drugs are moving forward. I think COVID-19 is a good example. Uh, for Dr. Gupta, Gupta, um, the COVID might, the, Europe decided they want to negotiate for a COVID vaccine up front before, and we went the opposite. We said we're going to invest in uh, pharmaceutical companies working together to bring a vaccine forward, and we know the results. Europe is in currently, unfortunately, very unfortunate for our allies in a lockdown where we're in Kentucky. You could get one today if you wanted a vaccine. Uh, so. Mr. Gupta, would you talk about what Europe did and how that's an example of what HR3, if we're, if we're going to import European-style drug pricing, what, how that could change the what results we get? Absolutely. Thank you, Congressman. So what we see on our side is that other countries seem to be willing to deny uh, this is particularly acute in the setting of, uh, as illustrated by COVID vaccines, but also as we see routinely with cancer medications, um, where, where there's significant delays that sometimes border on years to deliver groundbreaking cancer medications to patients, in, in, in an even more extreme example. Uh, and I think those are also examples we should look at as the kind of risk that would be entailed um, here uh, if we were to have price controls as per HR3. Price the way they price without, a, with, in my opinion, without having the results that they, they receive. Um, you know, Dr. Deeks in, a, in our long haul 
COVID hearing quote, and I'll quote him. He talked about how we're going to have innovative um, therapies for long COVID. And he said, quote, developing therapies will not happen unless we somehow find a way to incentivize our partners in the pharmaceutical industry, unquote. And so what we're, we're looking for innovative therapies and, and we need to deal with situations like Ms. Ball. Absolutely. But we don't need to affect uh, the young children with SMA. And that, that's what we, we want to move forward. Also, Dr. Gupta, I want to touch on uh, value-based agreements. These are arrangements that a new reimbursement method where manufacturers are paid if it were, if their drug works. And if it doesn't work as intended, they return payments via refunds or rebates. Uh, Representative Schrader and Representative Mullen and I are working on a bill for these two arrangements. Could you talk about value-based agreements and how that could affect drug pricing? Yes, thank you. I think that is a promising avenue to explore. Um, on an individual company and, and medicine basis, um, which is to say, you know, sort of a voluntary basis, I think it makes sense for, for companies to put together those kinds of creative price proposals. Um, and I think we should explore to, to, to sort of better understand the potential impact and how those could improve access. I'm a big believer in the Medicare Part D that we do need to... Uh, get smoothing so people don't have to pay everything up front in, in January when their new deductible moves forward and also cap out-of-pocket expenses. But right, if you're just subsidizing a rising drug price marketplace, it does change, moves money around, as Dr. Sachs said. So I think we need to do work to do patent reform, as uh, Representative Schrader and I have worked on already, to make sure that we get competition into the marketplace as soon as possible. Protect patents for innovation, but bring competition as soon as possible. And Madam Chair, my time has expired. Thank you for having this hearing. Uh, the gentleman uh, yields back. Uh, the chair is uh, pleased to recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Butterfield, for your five minutes of questions. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning to you. It is still morning here on the East Coast. No, no, <laughs> no it's not. No, it's not. It's <laughs> after 12 noon, but uh, thank you. It's still morning on the West Coast, but right. uh, we, we've passed that noon mark here in Washington. But thank you uh, for convening this most important hearing today. Uh, you know, Madam Chair, we've we've talked about drug pricing on this committee now for years, and it's time mm -hmm. for action. Uh, I could guarantee passage if my Republican friends will just work with us, not just throw one-liners at us, but just work with us. We can get this done. We can get it done in this session of Congress. And so thank you for the, the hearing today and thank you to our witnesses. Let me begin with uh, Professor Sachs. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Dur during my time in Congress, I've heard from countless constituents who say they cannot afford their prescription medications. We all hear it when we go home. It isn't right that someone in our country should have to choose between food and medicine. It's just not right. Uh, it isn't right that one in three U.S. adult patients forego desperately needed medications because of cost. In my home state of North Carolina, including right there in my district, uh, we, we are the home to many biotech and pharmaceutical manufacturers. And I believe that innovation by these companies should be encouraged. Uh, but clearly, the American people are suffering, and we, we all know that. Uh, the status quo is not acceptable. Congress must act to ensure that the American people have access to and can afford the treatments that they need. And so all of that to say, uh, Professor Sachs, HR3 creates a new $2,000 out-of-pocket cap on Part D spending. I think you would agree that this new limit would be welcome news to millions of beneficiaries. Now, you explained a few minutes ago, if I heard it correctly, to, to Chairman Pallone, that an out-of-pocket cap cannot lower drug costs on its own. I think you said that. Uh, how will the other pieces of HR 3 lower costs for seniors? Thank you, Congressman. This is an important distinction. HR 3 recognizes that reducing patients' out-of-pocket costs is critical, but on its own, that's not the same thing as reducing drug prices. It covers those up. It actually makes it harder to see that a company is raising its prices 27 times, as we heard from Ms. Ball. So it's important to lower patients' out-of-pocket costs, and that $2,000 cap would be a huge help to many Medicare beneficiaries. But it's important to also use the other elements of HR3 
to discourage companies from increasing their prices as fast as we've heard them do already in this hearing. And I'm sure we'll hear more about it later as well. And it's important to use the negotiating elements of HR3 to really make sure that the government has a strong hand in bargaining for the prices of these products when we're paying many times more than comparable countries for the very same drugs. Precisely. And thank you so much for that. Let's talk for a minute or two about rare diseases. Uh, You may know that I am the co-chair of the Rare Disease Caucus here in the House. Uh, Over 95 percent of rare diseases, people don't realize this, over 95 percent of rare diseases do not have any treatment at all. Many, like sickle cell, uh, which predominantly affects African-Americans, are chronically overlooked and underfunded. We must foster the creation of cures for these conditions. Uh, Ms. Sachs, you discuss in your testimony various ways that HR3 could impact future drug development. Do you anticipate a large impact on first-in-class products for rare diseases like sickle cell? I do not, and here's the reason why. Most rare disease drugs won't qualify for negotiations under HR3 because only the top 125 drugs under Medicare Part D and the top 125 drugs more generally are even eligible for negotiations. And so for the top selling drugs in Medicare, we're often talking about drugs that hundreds of thousands of Medicare Part D patients are taking to say nothing of patients outside of Medicare. But by definition, orphan drugs are treating very small populations of patients. And it's very difficult for them to become top spend drugs of the type that would even qualify for negotiations. I also do know that there has been bipartisan interest in Congress in the last few years of looking at when companies might be abusing the Orphan Drug Act, such as to extend their monopolies by stacking orphan drug exclusivity periods. So it's possible that there might need to be some attention to those concerns, but it's very unlikely that rare disease drugs would be under the negotiating uh, scope of HR3. Not never, but unlikely. Thank you so very much. I'll end with the last uh, statement, uh, the first statement that I made during my remarks. 95% of rare diseases do not have a treatment. Colleagues, let's redouble our efforts. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. The gentleman yields back and we thank him. Uh, The chair is pleased to recognize the ranking member of the full committee, uh, Ms. Uh, Kathy McMorris-Rogers. Thank you, Madam Chair. And just let me say, we're, we're anxious to go to work to focus on cures and, for those with rare diseases and beyond. I am committed, Republicans are committed to addressing how we bring down the cost of prescription drugs. It is a priority issue. Uh, anxious to work with Republicans and Democrats on solutions. Uh, you know, we can build on right to try. We can continue to expand the generics. Transparency, accountability for PBMs is priority. Uh, I'm very concerned, though, about the current approach and the impact that it's going to have on innovations and curing diseases from a very big picture. So I wanted to start with Dr. Gupta and and just thank you again for joining us, bringing your expertise and experience. You know, you spoke about us living at this, the dawn of a golden age of innovation. And it is one of those times that we should just be focusing on how we continue to lead in ways that are going to result in life-saving, life-changing therapies and treatments. I would like to ask you, what are you most excited about? And what, and put in layman's, layman's terms, what it means for patients and families across the country, and, and if you have any concerns about the proposal before this committee this morning. Thank you, Congresswoman. What I'm most excited about is, uh, you know, several years ago, we used to have a concept in our, in our industry of uh, targets that were called undruggable, which meant that with the toolkit that we had to, to develop medicines, we simply couldn't hit them. We knew you know, where the disease was coming from, but we couldn't do anything about it. Increasingly, that word is leaving our vocabulary. And I think that is the most exciting you know, development. I, when I say we're at the dawn of a golden age, I really believe that. And as you said, Congressman, I think we should pour gasoline on the fire rather than trying to snuff it out. Yes. Thank you for that. Uh, Ms. Davis, I wanted to thank you for joining us today and sharing your story. You know, as a mom, I'm always amazed and inspired uh, by others and especially all that you have done for your son, Hunter, and fighting for him. 
you basically took a, a never say no attitude and that determination is one that we all admire. Um, I appreciated you highlighting the, the miracle drug that has now been made available to those with SMA. And as we just heard from Dr. Gupta, you know, the concern is that proposals like HR3 are going to disrupt the, the path to those breakthroughs for the next generation of children like Hunter. As you know, the SMA treatment uh, became more widely available in the U.S. in February of 2017. But sadly, it wasn't made available in Australia until 11 months later or six months later in Canada, four months later in France, five months later in Germany, six months later in Japan, six months later in the U.K., the bill we're discussing today would import into the U.S. the pricing schemes from those countries who didn't have the kind of drug that Hunter needed available until much later. So what would you tell the, the members of this committee about what the, the extra four, five, six, or 11 months without this treatment would have meant for you and Hunter? So for SMA, every day matters. Sometimes every minute matters. Once motor neurons are lost, we can't get them back. And so what it would mean is more babies and children would be permanently disabled and more lives would be lost. And that is something we cannot afford to allow happen. Um, in fact, we, we really need to be working for uh, pre-symptomatic diagnosis treatment, not only for SMA, but all of these childhood conditions. Um. Thank you very much. And I also wanted to ask if you would just speak to the, the, the way that other countries define the value of a life and, and how that impacts the availability and also the, potentially the price of drugs. Yes, uh, it's based on the quality metrics and it's used by discounting the, the value of the the patient's life based on how chronically ill or disabled they are, and then multiplying that by the number of years that they anticipate the survival. And so it's a very discriminatory practice, and it's something that we have acted um, vigorously to prevent from happening in the U.S., as we've done with ICER. We prevented CVS Caremark from importing ICER's quality metrics, and we also have uh, oppose the ventilator medical rationing during COVID using those measures as well. Yes. Thank you for joining us and speaking out. My time's expired. I yield back. Uh, the gentlewoman yields back. Uh, Chair is uh, pleased to recognize uh, the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Matsui, for your five minutes of questions. Great to see you, Doris. You too, Anna, and everybody else. And thank you very much, Madam Chair, for calling this hearing. It's in so important, and thank you for the witnesses for being here. Um, it's important to hear about your experiences and uh, your expertise. Uh, I know there's been a lot of conversation on the out-of-pocket cap in Part D, and I've listened to uh, Professor Sachs and understand that this is just one tool, but particularly for beneficiaries as they have challenging um, prescription drug costs is really very, very important. So just a comment, uh, Ms. Ball, can you share what a Let's say a two thousand dollar out of pocket maximum in your Part D plan would mean for you. Would this provide you with better certainty for your total drug cost for the year? Ms. Ball, are you present? Okay, let me go on here. I had okay. trouble with unmuting. I'm so sorry. Yes, how it would it benefit me is is that. I would be able to know exactly what I would need if we um, my pricing went up to 2000. But basically what happens is that I would have the ability to receive my drugs, which is the most important part, because at the time um, that it went to six thousand dollars, there was no way that I could have. And that really was devastating to my health and to my family. So it would help in a, a great deal. I'm sorry, we can't hear you, ma'am. Doris, uh, you need to unmute. Okay. Sorry about that. I got unmuted. 
Uh, I want to talk about the role of rebates. Reforms like the inflationary rebates and HR3 will realign the incentives manufacturers have for raising their prices, but may be limited in their ability to assist Medicare in obtaining lower prices, particularly on specialty drugs. A similar problem exists with rebates that drug manufacturers pay to PBMs and insurers. Typically, these post-sale rebates or discounts are not available for drugs that lack competition. Professor Sachs, for expensive drugs that have no manufacturer rebates, what leverage do Part D plans and PBM currently have to negotiate lower prices? They have little to no leverage today. Okay. Uh, Professor Sachs, infl infl inflationary rebates can address the overall growth of a drug's price over time. But what other mechanisms are needed to reduce costs, particularly for specialty drugs with an initially high list price? Exactly. As you just said, the inflationary rebates will be important to discourage or prevent drug companies from hiking the list prices of their drugs more quickly than inflation. But for companies that set a high price uh, in the first place, especially where that price is many times what our uh, uh, other countries are paying for the same drugs, HR3 gives the secretary the authority to negotiate for the prices of those drugs and strengthens their hand in that negotiating process. Okay, thank you. I want to go back to, um, we're talking about out-of-pocket um, caps. Um, Professor Sat, can you briefly describe how HR3's proposal to cap out-of-pocket costs compares to HR19 that we are also considering today? Yes, so the ideas are very similar to help patients afford their out-of-pocket costs, but the details are different in two important ways. So first, HR3 is more protective of patients. It imposes a $2,000 annual limit on patients' out-of-pocket costs rather than a $3,100 out-of-pocket limit on patients' out-of-pocket costs. And then second, HR19 imposes less responsibility on manufacturers in the catastrophic phase, only 20% compared to 30% in HR3, which will help manufacturers be discouraged from driving patients into that phase of their benefit. Okay, fine. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back my time. Uh, the gentlewoman yields back. A uh, pleasure to recognize the former chairman of the full committee uh, and the uh, uh, the Republican lead author of the CARES of the, um, uh, what's the matter with me? Um, 21st century, the, the cure, 21st century Cures Act. I just had a blank moment there. Uh, Mr. Upton, you're recognized for your five minutes of questions. Great to see you. Well, it is. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thanks for bearing with me a little bit. Our, we had a little issue with WebEx uh, getting access to it. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, and we all hope that uh, I already heard from Dave McKinley that his wife, Mary, uh, does well with this uh, surgery the, this afternoon. You know, a couple of things, you know, it, it's no secret that all of us on this committee have been very involved in, in health research. And obviously, 21st Century Cures is a major milestone for us when we passed it back in uh, 2016. President Obama signed into law. Uh, for me, doubling the money uh, for the NIH uh, back in the 90s, uh, working with Henry Waxman and John McCain, my, my good buddy, uh, w which was successful and obviously now. So we're beginning to work on Cures 2.0. And uh, SU, myself, and others uh, are very involved in, in that as well as Pallone and uh, leadership on, on both sides. Uh, I just want to thank Ms. Davis. Uh, you know, just a, a touching story for me and many on the committee that were back uh, on the committee back in 2015, uh, they saw two of my constituents, uh, two little beautiful girls, Brooke and uh, uh, we actually call them uh, Sleeping Beauty and Cinderella uh, from my district who were impacted with SMA and just so excited about the progress that's being made. But that's that's the case with every rare disease. So uh, cystic fibrosis, you know, all of them, we all want cures for these. And we, we really want to get uh, to the point where we can, we can be the, the lifeline uh, for those families. You know, in, in uh, 
one of the things that also drove us uh, to get 21st Century Cures done was that we realized that venture capital was leaving our country. It was going by, it dropped by 50% back in the early part of the 2010s, uh, early part of that decade, uh, going overseas because we weren't the leader in innovation. We weren't the leader in getting these uh, drugs approved. And I, I have a fear that uh, countries like China and India they haven't explicitly stated that they want to become global leaders in medical innovation yet, although they're trying. Uh, but it's often th they're those manufacturers that often seem to be cited the most in terms of tainted drugs, quality manufacturing issues, and the policies of HR3 could in fact make those countries potentially more attractive for R&D and manufacturing investments than the U.S. So Dr. Gupta, we want to take the chance that we could lose U.S. global leadership in this space, end up with fewer new medicines, potentially longer delays in access to new medicines in the regulatory systems, uh, which may not have the same gold standard that we have here in the U.S. Thank, thank you, Congressman. And I think you've outlined precisely the risk that uh, we face um, under some of the provisions of HR3. China is signaling to its companies it wants them to catch up and that they can charge relatively high prices in China. Um, it's expensive to run a clinical drug trial to the FDA standard, and I think you've outlined precisely um, what we may see if, if uh, that would happen. You know, one of the things, too, is I uh, hear colleagues on, on both sides that talk about where we are. We all want lower drug prices, that's for sure. We went sort of through the same argument last year by saying we have a bill, H.R. 19, it was actually bipartisan, was made up of bipartisan bills. Every one of them had Democratic and Republican support that we packaged together. Uh, and H.R. 3, we said, isn't going to get to the finish line. And exactly that same thing happened. And that's the fear, again, in this Congress, that H.R. 3, the way that it's designed now, same bill as last year, isn't going to get to the president's desk, whether it be a Republican or a Democrat. So why not take what we know we can agree on and move that, at least even do it first, rather than wait for H.R. 3. But I guess in my last minute, I just want to say, uh, one of the provisions in the cures that was signed into law was the Precision Medicine Initiative at the NIH. And many new innovative therapies are highly targeted, underscoring the importance of patients having access to a range of treatment options. The future of precision medicine and highly effective therapies is not for sure a one size fits all. That approach is at odds with how the drug pricing proposal would set prices for medicine. Determining a single price based on the price that we pay for medicines in other countries and population level comparative effectiveness research. Neither of these factors, as I understand it, will account for the value of those treatments to an individual patient. So are there any recognitions for personalized medicines included in the price setting in HR3, Dr. Gupta, in my last two seconds? Thank you, Congressman. I'll be brief. Um, uh, personally, you know, I'm actually unfamiliar with uh, with any provisions uh, that might cover that. I'll have to review that and get back to the committee. Thank okay. you. Okay, I look forward to it. With that, uh, Madam Chair, I yield back my balance of my time. Which is zero. the gentleman yields back, and it's a pleasure to recognize the gentlewoman from Florida, a wonderful member of our committee, uh, Ms. Castor, for your five minutes of questions. Well, thank you very much, Chairwoman Eshoo. Thank you for your leadership here. This is a very important hearing on legislation to lower the cost of prescription drugs. So thank you for calling us all together and thank you for uh, the testimony of our witnesses as well. I mean, it, it, I encourage everyone to go back to the memo uh, that summarizes the reason that we're here. I mean, drug prices in the United States continue to soar. The, the RAND study was cited uh, in that summary memo. Americans pay 256% more uh, for their prescription drugs than the average 32 uh, countries. And when you're talking about brand name drugs, it's more than that, 344% more. That's outrageous. It's, uh, and it's exacting a toll on families, uh, all of our neighbors, and it sure impacts the federal budget and the bottom line because of our extensive outlays for Medicare and Medicare Part D. Um, it, this just doesn't make sense anymore that uh, there is a prohibition on Medicare uh, negotiating uh, prices. And I wanna uh, give a shout out to our colleague, Peter Welch, who has spent a good 
bit of his time in Congress uh, fighting for this. And I think, Peter, uh, Representative Welch, I think this is our year that we're going to get it done. And I really invite our Republican colleagues to join us on this, to, to lift that prohibition on negotiating drug prices. If we do it in the VA, it works. And it's really anti-American, isn't it, that we would prohibit uh, anyone from negotiating something in America. Uh, but I'd like to spend, uh, Professor Sachs, a little time with you to talk about uh, generic alternative and sole source drugs that don't have the market forces uh, to drive the price down. We, we've seen in the current market, we don't have the tools to restrain those costs. Will you describe for us the way that drug makers often determine a price for sole source products? Is it fair to say that there isn't a lot of leverage for employers or insurance companies uh, to control costs for these drugs, uh, short of excluding coverage that we don't want to do? Thank you. So as to your question of how companies determine prices for these drugs, it is very common to hear that drug companies, they charge what the market will bear. They're not looking just to recoup their R&D investments. They're looking at other drugs. They're looking at services and benchmarking their prices accordingly. And you're also right to suggest that there isn't a lot of leverage for employers or insurers to control costs for those drugs. But I don't think it's necessarily the case that exclusion or the threat of exclusion is necessary. And so for an example here, I think we could look to Medicaid. Medicaid is required by law to cover essentially all FDA-approved drugs, but in exchange, it's entitled to preferred pricing benefits, including inflationary rebates of the type we're considering today, and different governmental reports have shown that those inflationary rebates are very effective in helping Medicaid get much better prices than Medicare Part D for the same product. So given this, um, you appear to agree that it makes sense to give the Secretary of HHS, the power to negotiate uh, prices of certain high-priced drugs, that the lack of competition and uh, that where we have a lack of competition and, and our neighbors are forced to choose between taking their medications or eating or paying for a roof over their heads. Is that right? Yes, yes. Unfortunately, too often, as I mentioned, it's one in four, almost one in four Americans, 24%, including 23% of seniors who have difficulty affording these medications. So some of the bills today uh, do address the issue of generic competition uh, by addressing some of the major barriers to effective, timely uh, generic entry. These policies are crucial to making markets for prescription drugs work more effectively. However, why is it not enough on its own? Uh, why must we also pass a comprehensive solution like what is contained in HR3 in order to meaningfully bring down drug prices for all Americans? Yes, this is such an important question. And these bills promoting generic competition are important. I don't want to suggest that Congress shouldn't pass them, but they are reactive. So as we heard from Professor Carrier's testimony, pharmaceutical firms have been engaging in pay for delay deals, citizen petitions, product hopping is another example of this for years. And if Congress is now able to crack down on those, industry will develop innovative new ways to extend their monopolies. A comprehensive negotiating strategy would limit, although probably not completely avoid, the need to play this kind of whack-a-mole with pharmaceutical company gaming tactics in the first place. I agree. I think HR3 is a very important comprehensive approach to controlling drug prices for all of our neighbors. So thank you, Chairwoman Eshi, for having this hearing, and I yield back my time. Uh, the gentlewoman yields back. It's a uh, pleasure to uh, recognize uh, Dr. Burgess for your five minutes of questions. I thank the chair, and, and uh, just like in the last Congress, this hearing has been uh, has been very instructional and Certainly, I have uh, enjoyed the testimony of our witnesses. Dr. Gupta, if I could ask you, I think we'd all could, uh, acknowledge that the National Institute of Health is a national treasure, and it has contributed mightily to the basic research and understanding of many diseases. But it doesn't seem to me like the agency was designed uh, with the development of bringing new drugs to market in mind. So. Could you elaborate on that a little bit, the process of bringing a new drug to market 
in the process, for example, in scaling up the coronavirus vaccine? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Congressman. I think that's a very important point. And the NIH is a fabulous organization, world class, but it's not a drug development organization. And the core skill set of uh, biotech and pharma companies is developing medicines, um, uh, getting them, you know, manufacturing them, running them through clinical trials, interfacing with the uh, regulators, and then, of course, actually selling them. There is no glide path to market a drug once it's approved. There's no national formulary. And it is actually, and I think big companies are better than small companies, it's actually important to have um, the ability to make sure that physicians and patients can get them and are aware of them. Um, and the NIH is, is not equipped to take um, uh, the prototypes that they sometimes build or the scientific ideas they sometimes generate all the way through that lengthy process. Right. When, when Zika was a concern several years ago and that multiple meetings with Dr. Fauci out of the NIH on this topic, and he did point out that they have a small manufacturing capability capacity at NIH, but I would underscore small and nothing of the sort that would have uh, permitted the, the rapid introduction of the coronavirus vaccine, for example, that did require the involvement of the private sector. And I think we're all grateful that that, uh, that, that involvement occurred. So uh, Dr. Lupe, you're staying with you for a minute. You actually have some experience in the in the, in, the, in the business world, uh, you've probably been a part of negotiations yourself from time to time. The excise tax, as enumerated in HR3, does that look like a negotiation process to you? Thank you. I think that uh, that mechanism would uh, would provide a lot of leverage um, uh, to, to a party that. Uh, would, would um, disadvantage greatly, uh, you, you know, the, the counterparty there. Well, and, and again, you also understand, I mean, capital, investment of capital is a, a lot of things, and a lot of them are, are good things, but capital is generally not known for being courageous. And so if capital is challenged in, in one location, what's likely to happen? Well, thank you. I appreciate the chance to, to comment on this as well. Yeah, just from the laws of economics, I can't think of an example where investors would put their capital at risk in a field that faces price controls. But I, I think it's also worth sharing a little bit about the odds of, of a drug making it all the way through the FDA. Only one in 25 drug candidates will make it from preclinical studies through FDA approval. And on average, the cost required to support a development program is between one and $2 billion. Uh, and uh, keeping, keeping the, uh, the incentive structure we have in place is clearly necessary to continue uh, the output that we have. I appreciate your your uh, your input on that. Um, I'm going to leave to our colleague Morgan Griffith to discuss about the takings clause and the constitutionality of the uh, of the legislation. I think he tried to rescue it last Congress. I don't know if he's of a mind to try to rescue it this Congress. But uh, again, I'll let him speak to that. Uh, Ms. Davis, if I could just ask you, uh, are there any medications or therapy that your son is currently taking? that would not be available in the countries, the HR3 international reference pricing is, uh, that, that, it, that that concept is based upon. So it, it varies on the type of patients, um, especially for the patients that are on ventilators, they are not able to access treatments in many of the countries because the qualities the quality uh, metrics used to develop um, the inclusion criteria excludes those those patients. Their val their lives are not deemed valuable enough to access the treatment. So the calculation of the quality adjusted life year makes them ineligible, and by making them ineligible, what does that do to their to their to the outlook for their lifespan? it significantly diminishes their lifespan. And not only their lifespan, but the quality of life during that lifespan. <clears throat> so, you know, we need to be mindful of things like that as we, as we uh, contemplate a bill like HR 3. HR 19 has a number of great provisions, all bipartisan. A number of them got passed in the last Congress, a couple of them have passed this Congress and been signed into law. So we ought, you know, for, for my money, we ought to be working on what works get it done and, and uh, let the American people help us sort it out. 
But I thank the chair for the recognition and I'll yield back. The gentleman yields back. Please note, I gave you 35 extra seconds there. Um, the, chair, the chair is uh, uh, pleased to recognize the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Sarbane. You have those shades on? Where are you? I'm over here. Thank you. There you are. Oh, we can see your. Yes. Thank you very much, Madam face. Chair. Yeah. Uh, appreciate the opportunity. Before his passing in 2019, Chairman Cummings, who represented Baltimore as I do and for whom this critical legislation is named, as you know, he worked tirelessly to uncover why the prices of life-saving drugs were so high that people simply could not afford them, why people would need to ration their drugs or go without. He felt this very, very deeply. I saw that uh, every single day as he moved around his district, his neighborhood. Just couldn't understand why this was the case in, in a nation as great as America. Uh, we both heard, he and I, and I continue to hear these stories today uh, from Maryland constituents as to how the high prices of prescription drugs forces them to make impossible choices, endangering their health and their lives. And all of this is happening while drug companies continue to rake in these incredible profits between 2011 and 2016. We know that list prices went up 129% for 14 of the top selling drugs. Top selling because they're so critical uh, for people out there. At the same time, out-of-pocket spending by patients increased by 85% for specialty medicines and by 42% for non-specialty drugs, even after taking inflation into account. This is just plain wrong. As former chairman of the Oversight Committee, a committee on which I also served, Chairman Cummings worked tirelessly, as, as I've said, to fix this problem. The Oversight Committee's work centered on both lowering prices for individuals and families across the country, as well as removing waste fraud and abuse from government spending, and our hearing today continues uh, that effort. Uh, Professor Sachs, um, it, it seems like we're asking you the same basic questions over and over again. We're doing that because it's really important and because this bill can solve a lot of the challenges that Americans face. So tell me again, why is giving Medicare the power to negotiate such a central tool in effectively lowering drug prices? And and maybe focus on the centrality piece of that. Like there's a lot of other things that we can and we should do to address the high prices. But this specific tool of giving Medicare the opportunity to negotiate is really at the heart of, it's, it's, it's in the center of our toolkit. So can you speak to that a little bit more? Yes, absolutely. And, and just to clarify, because the prescription drug pricing issue is so complicated. There's not one reason why the price of a drug can be high or why patients might have difficulty affording their medications. It is important to ask and answer these questions in slightly different formats repeatedly so that we know what's at stake here for patients and innovation and access. So to answer your question more specifically, the centrality of negotiation to HR3 is that it gives the government more authority to uh, have an equal position at the bargaining table with these drug companies who are the manufacturers of high-priced sole source drugs. What do you do for Copaxone? What do you do for Humira? There's a question there about whether companies that have been on the market for a long time, who've now recouped their monopolies, but who've managed to delay generic competition, and it's really hard to crack down on a hundred patents in a single drug portfolio or on some of these other tactics. Allowing the government to negotiate, just as many other countries do, would allow us to lower the prices of some of these drugs and get more fair prices for patients and payers. Thank you. And it's so American to allow negotiation in the market. Yeah, it's the government doing the negotiating. Okay, but that's the way it's supposed to work uh, in our system with two parties bargaining to get to a good a good result here. And, and obviously, the government's hands have been tied um, kind of arbitrarily for years now. 
My understanding is that the CBO um, estimates a negotiation framework in HR3 will lower federal spending by $456 billion. That's incredible. While also saving Medicare $42 billion on other health expenses, simply because beneficiaries will be able to fill the prescriptions that will keep them healthy. Let me just emphasize that. Because patients will be able to get prescription drugs that they cannot get right now, they will be healthier and Medicare will save $42 billion on health care costs. Madam Chair, thank you for this hearing. Very, very important. I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back and uh, thank you for uh, having us look back at, uh, uh, you know, really the central work of our, as I said in my opening statement, our beloved colleague, Elijah Cummings. Uh, in so many ways, he set the table uh, for what we are doing today and going forward. Uh, it's a pleasure to recognize the uh, gentleman from Virginia, uh, Mr. Griffith, uh, for your five minutes of probing questions. Thank you very much. I appreciate it very much, uh, Madam Chair. Let, let me just say that, uh, and I got to get this off my chest, we've been talking about negotiations, but we don't have negotiations in this bill. And that's the problem, because what we have is a system that says, if you don't agree to the price dictated by the government, you can pay a, a tax of 65 to 95 percent of the gross revenues for that drug in order to be able to sell it within the United States. Now, I, I get very concerned about that, as I did two years ago, because when it comes to the constitutionality of a bill, it's not just the courts that have jurisdiction to determine that constitutionality. This committee and Congress also have a role and have a duty to determine whether or not we're passing bills that are constitutional. The courts may be the final arbiter of that question, but we have a duty to look at it too. And when you look at the concerns that were raised, not just by me two years ago, but by others, including the Congressional Research Service, we have Eighth Amendment concerns. While Congress has the power to levy taxes, uh, that's not that that levy is or that ability is not without limitation, especially with regard to taxes that are actually more penalties or fines. And I think a court could reasonably find these taxes are at least in part punitive and therefore in violation of the Eighth Amendment of the Constitution. The one that I very first raised was the Fifth Amendment concern, and it's a takings clause, because when you say to somebody, you can't sell your intellectual property or your, your product in the United States unless you give us 65 to 95 percent of your gross sales you're taking that property away from them. You're taking away their hard-earned intellectual property. And I have concerns about that. Now, I'm one of the people on the Republican side of the aisle that actually would consider negotiation, and I think we should have some negotiation ability. And I even have a bill in to do that in certain stressed areas. That being said, we have to do it in a constitutional manner. And Madam Chair, I just don't think this bill is constitutional. When you limit prices manufacturers can charge, and you say, you know, you're being forced to accept the price for a drug, and that could mean significant economic loss for the developer because you're going to take not of the profit, but up to 95% of the gross sales. That's a taking, Madam Chair. And I, I, I know that everybody's trying to do the right thing. And, and you've heard that HR 19 has some positives from the witnesses, and we've heard that that there are other positives. But if we're going to do the right thing, even when we disagree, let's at least do it constitutionally. Now, let me shift before I finish my tirade. Let me shift to uh, H.R. 2843, because I think this one also has concerns. And I think we can all agree that FDA's citizen petition process can be very useful and must be implemented in, implemented in a way that prevents abuse. And, and that bill, H.R. 2843, known as the Stop Games Act, seeks to address potential abuses. While I admire that goal, I remain concerned that the bill currently does nothing to resolve potential First Amendment issues, which I also apparently raised back in 2019. Now, those that deals with the First Amendment that guarantees the right to petition the U.S. government for redress of grievances. Yet, H.R. 2843 would allow the FDA to summarily deny, that is, to not even consider citizen petitions 
at its own discretion, even if they raise valid scientific or regulatory concerns. If there is a scientific basis for petitioning FDA that has not been considered previously and has not and has been timely submitted, I believe the agency should have a timely process to review the petition and make a decision based on the merits. Now, Madam Chair, I think we can both agree, and I think all of us can agree, that we need to have a process that's a little quicker. And right now it is being used and gained by uh, certain parties in the system to make this process long and drawn out. But again, let's figure out a way we can fix that without completely eliminating the right to seek redress uh, from the government by citizens who may have a legitimate concern. And there are bad actors and we have to figure out you know, how we set that system up. But I will submit to you that HR, uh, 2843 is not the vehicle as it is currently written that we ought to do that with. So, Madam Chair, I hope as we work forward in, in this, as we go through subcommittee, as we go to full committee with actual bills and the bills that we're discussing today, that we're open to doing some amendments to try to make sure that we can, even if I don't agree with it 100%, let's at least pass a product out of this committee that meets the constitutional test and that we can all feel comfortable is actually constitutional. And Madam Chair, my time is up and I yield back. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman yields back, uh, always thoughtful. Uh, the chair now, uh, with pleasure, recognizes uh, the gentleman from Vermont, uh, Mr. Welch. And I think I'm going to announce who follows. So just in case you want to step away, uh, you know that your time is almost at hand, uh, followed by Mr. Bill Arrakis from, uh, from Florida. So Mr. Welch, you're uh, thank you for all of the work you've done uh, in the uh, whole area of drugs and uh, their costliness. Um, you're recognized. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, we've got two lawyers following one another, and I disagree with uh, Mr. Griffin on the constitutionality of this. Uh, but I do agree with many of the proposals that our Republican colleagues have in their bill. But the issue here is. Uh, government negotiation. And there's a number, I'm going to step back for a minute and put this in a context. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry is dead set against governmental action through negotiation. And why wouldn't they be? Uh, they have record profits. Representative Castor mentioned that we pay two and three times the prices paid for the same drug in other countries. Pharma is not opposed to governmental action and it is governmental action that provides them with patent protection and the exclusive right to use the product. Pharma is not opposed to governmental action when it comes to taxpayer financing of the National Institute of Health and all of the research that taxpayers pay for that then are oftentimes utilized and monetized by the pharmaceutical industry. Pharma is not opposed to governmental action when it comes to creating a guaranteed market in Medicare and Medicaid. So pharma, pharma has a pretty good arrangement. They've got a guaranteed market. They've got pricing power that is legislated and authorized by the government. <clears throat> and what we've seen is that it's a, it's a model that works and they make billions and billions of dollars and the CEOs make millions and millions of dollars in salary. Pharma oftentimes spends far more on advertising than it does on research and development. And all of these things add up to an incredible punitive price gouging impact on taxpayers, on individuals, and very significantly on many of our employers who are doing every single thing they can to maintain employer-sponsored health care for their valued employees. And when those employers get the notice from the insurance company, the premiums are going up 15 and 20 percent, and then talk to their workers about this year, I'm afraid we can't have a raise because we've got to keep your insurance. All of that is continuing to occur and will never stop unless we address the cost. And the biggest threat, the biggest threat to access to healthcare is the cost of healthcare. It's the cost. So unless we face this, 
in the cost of healthcare is most exploding in the area of pharmaceuticals, we are going to allow the erosion of access to healthcare for the American workers, American seniors, and American kids. The argument is being made that if we proceed with price negotiation of any sort, it's going to adversely affect uh, innovation. And I'd like to ask uh, I'd like to ask Professor Sachs to address that directly. Thank you, Congressman. I, I want to say that as a property law professor, I share your skepticism of the takings argument. I'd be happy to discuss that in more detail at a later date. But to respond directly to your question about innovation, you're right. Industry argues that innovation will be harmed no matter what the reform is. They make this claim without regard to the size of the pricing reform, without regard to when in a product's life cycle it would take effect, without regard to what products it would impact. Today, they make this argument about HR3, but they've also made it about bills that would crack down on paper delay arrangements or product hopping. HHS Secretary Alex Azar called this a tired talking point, and he was right. If industry won't dis uh, distinguish between the CREATES Act and HR3, then this committee should consider how seriously their arguments should be taken. I'm going to have to interrupt you. I, thank you. Uh, I just want to make two points. One, we've got to get rid of DIR fees that's hammering our local pharmacies and they provide good service. And then second, I want to address this question of COVID and us having it and Europe being behind us. This was, we negotiated with pharma to buy at a reasonable, reasonable price, the vaccine, and we funded them in their effort. In Europe, their problem was the negotiation. They had 27 countries that couldn't come to an agreement on what a bit would they would make. I yield back and I thank the chair uh, and my colleagues for this hearing. The gentleman yields back. A pleasure to recognize the gentleman from uh, Oregon. Uh, no, uh, the gentleman from Florida. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Bill Iraq is followed by the gentleman from Oregon, uh, Mr. Schrader. So you're recognized for your five minutes. Great to see you, Gus. Thank you. Good seeing you, too. With all due respect to Mr. Schrader, my good friend, I want to remain in Florida. <laughs> uh, I, did, I do want to say this. Uh, you know, with res uh, I want to respond to a representative, my good friend, Representative Castor, with regards she brought up the VA. Uh, and I understand uh, there is an access issue. I know they, uh, the VA does negotiate drug prices. Uh, however, 24 of the top 50 drugs on the national formulary are not covered uh, by the VA. And I don't think that's a good thing for our veterans. And I understand only 63% of uh, our veterans actually use, they qualify that are enrolled in the VA. I use the, get their drugs from the VA. So that's a big problem, uh, folks, and, uh, and we need to address that. There's no question. Uh, I want to get into now the rare diseases, if that's okay. Uh, and I want to thank the chairman uh, for this hearing, very informative hearing. And I remain committed to working with my ENC colleagues on both sides of the aisle uh, to put patients over politics by advancing bipartisan solutions. So that said, I'm very concerned about the impact of HR3, uh, patients with incredibly complex rare diseases, as you know, I'm the co-chair of the Rare Disease Caucus. Um, along with Representative Butterfield, we've worked uh, done some really good things for our rare disease, disease patients uh, the last few years. So the bulk of R&D for medicines for rare diseases comes from the biopharma industry. In 2018, the biopharma industry uh, invested $102 billion in R&D, 100% of which was focused on drug development. Contrast that with the entire NIH budget of fiscal year 2018, which was $35.4 billion, with only 8% focused directly on research related to drug development. We need a robust biopharma industry, and I think everyone agrees to that, investing in rare diseases. If reference pricing or similar policies are put into place, 
I, I worry that direct investment in rare diseases where the failure rates are high will diminish and, uh, and companies will only, uh, again, do the safe things, uh, make the safe bets. And our children are suffering. Our people with rare diseases are suffering. And Representative Butterfield was right about that. 95% of these rare diseases have no cures or treatments. Very unfortunate. Policies like referencing pricing and government price settings will effectively turn our biopharma industry into a risk-averse, think out inside the box rather than outside the box commodity industry. And I'm concerned. That is not what American patients want. Okay, Dr. Kuka, uh, Kuka I, I have a question for you. Uh, can you speak uh, to how HR3 would impact complex rare diseases and investments there uh, due to the economic incentives in HR3 uh, with a signal to manufacturers to invest in rare diseases or lower costs following up? What kind of an effect would HR3 uh, three have on, uh, on investments, R&D, with regard to rare diseases. Please. Thank you, Congressman. Well, first, I think it's important to recognize that uh, small biopharma companies uh, are the ones driving innovation. They comprise about 70% of drugs in phase three, and they are the ones that primarily serve rare disease patient populations. Uh, so they are the ones that have to seek uh, raising capital from, from investors. And, uh, and I think because of that phenomenon and because rare disease populations are, of course, smaller, um, meaning that price controls would, would actually impact them uh, disproportionately in terms of the revenue potential uh, medicines that are being developed. My belief is that uh, price controls, as, as contemplated by HR3, would significantly negatively impact rare disease patients. Uh, okay, one, one last question, and then I want to go to Ms. Ms. Davis, if I'm permitted. Ultimately, would HR3 increase or decrease China and foreign influence over U.S. biomedical research? Yes or no? This is for uh, Mr. Gupta. I, think, I don't think it would increase influence over existing U.S. companies. I think it would give China a chance to equilibrate and develop an ecosystem uh, to where they could start to bring innovative drugs to market. Okay. I know I don't have uh, – well, you know what, Madam Chair, I'm sorry. I'm not going to go over the time. Uh, so I'll yield back. Thank you. I just had the vaccine shot, so I'm a little bit fatigued, but I apologize for that. But uh, I appreciate you giving me the time. Well, thank you, uh, Gus, and uh, bravo to you for getting the, uh, 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 for being vaccinated. My second, my second dose, second example. dose, so I'm done. Yeah. It's a great thank example you. to everyone else and and uh, the people in our country, and you give my love to mom and dad, all right? Uh, it's a pleasure will. to Thank recognize uh, uh, the gentleman from uh, Oregon, uh, Mr. Schrader, and we're all grateful to you for your thoughtfulness, your work, uh, and he'll be followed by uh, the gentleman from Missouri, uh, Mr. Long. So you're recognized, uh, Kurt, for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Appreciate Appreciate the hearing. This is This is good stuff. Uh, Dr. Gupta, just trying to follow up a little bit on what my good friend and colleague, uh, uh, Rep. Bill Rockus was talking about. But on the flip side, uh, if, uh, you know, given your role in venture capital, if if we were to do uh, HR3, uh, how or would that impact uh, investments in the biotechnology uh, startup sector? Thank you, Congressman. I I think that the impacts would be far reaching, they'd be wide and they'd be generally negative. I, I think that uh, if there are sectors that uh, could could seek that investment that provide safer uh, returns or, or better returns, the prospect of that, you may see a diminishment of the types of risk that investors are willing to take in biotech. Any Would there be any difference if instead of the benchmarking to a set price, we just uh, allowed negotiations on the part of Medicare like we do VA and certain states Medicaid? Would that be different? I think that um, it, it unfortunately doesn't help address the core issue, which I think remains the barriers to access primarily at the, at the, at the end of the funnel, which is out-of-pocket costs and price controls of any sort do not ensure that the payers will pass those savings on to patients. So I, I uh, hesitate to, um, 
to suggest that there may be um, uh, some amount of negotiation uh, without focusing first on what we see as the, the larger problems. Okay. Okay. I just saw negotiation is distinctly different than benchmarking personally. Uh, and we do that in so many other areas. And I assume that a lot of folks take that into account when they make their investments uh, going forward. Ms. Sachs, uh, you uh, mentioned a couple of other topics you'd like to see the committee address, maybe at a later date, uh, uh, looking at other parts of the supply chain. I think this committee totally agrees with you. We've had numerous hearings over the last several years on this. Uh, are there particular policies that uh, address entities beyond the pharmaceutical manufacturers that you think we should be really prioritizing? Yes, absolutely. So in particular, in thinking about the ways in which different actors have incentives to drive prices up rather than down, I do think it's important to look not just at the pharmaceutical industry, but also at the roles insurers, pharmacy benefit managers, and even physicians or provider groups in general can play in driving prices up rather than down. So this committee has already considered uh, some of these proposals, but others would include taking a closer look at pharmacy benefit manager practices, at some of these issues in terms of spread pricing. I know this is also a topic of robust interest at the state level with several state attorneys general interested in either having already brought lawsuits uh, against the topic or certainly discussing so publicly. Uh, you've also uh, discussed a little bit about uh, considering the linking of uh, clinical value uh, uh, to price of drugs paid for, particularly by a governmental entity. Uh, do you think that allowing governments to craft arrangements, uh, you know, for a, a drug paying for it over a period of time uh, or based on outcomes would be uh, uh, would be beneficial also? Congressman, I actually think that's two different questions, and so I'm going to answer them very briefly because I know we're short on time. So first, this idea of value assessment, if we have two drugs that are treating the same condition, value assessment means we want to pay more for the drug that works better. And if we do that, companies will know that the better the drug they make, the more money they're going to make. They'll invest more in products treating unmet needs. But this idea of value-based pricing, which has come up already in a discussion today, that's what the pharmaceutical industry wants to call it, this idea of outcomes-based contracts. But there's nothing about either the initial or the rebated price of the product, which are necessarily tied to its clinical value. So I like to call them innovative contracting models. The point I want to make about them is that they're voluntary for industry to engage in. Industry won't engage in these deals unless they think it makes them more money, not less. Right now, they're not required to enter into those deals, and that's certainly of concern for payers. Well, that may be uh, something we'd want to work on in the future to get at those uh, concerns that you have. Now, I'm a big supporter of negotiating prices in the Medicare range. We already do it VA. We do it for many states and, and Medicaid, uh, but I also want to make sure we get something done. I do have some reservations about the indexing personally, and so do my constituents. I've heard from a bunch of them of late, uh, but I think there's overwhelming bipartisan, bicameral agreement to work on some sort of solution here that encompasses some of HR 19, which is great, but doesn't go far enough. Maybe something not quite as robust as our HR 3, but I, I'm feeling good about the opportunity here and really appreciate having the hearing, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. I yield back. Uh, the gentleman yields back, and uh, you have our gratitude for your thoughtful work, Kurt. Uh, the chair is pleased to recognize the gentleman from Missouri, who's always, um, well, there's no one like Billy Long, so you're recognized for five minutes. <laughs> and followed by, excuse me, followed by Mr. Cardenas from California. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I appreciate it very much. I am saddened today that. Uh, we can't tackle this situation, the drug pricing situation, the same way with the same bipartisanship and the same enthusiasm that we did 21st century cures when you and Chairman Upton worked so hard with the entire committee. And I remember a vote coming out of the subcommittee that was 52 to nothing. I don't know if that ever been done before. And uh, I don't know what it takes to get back to that place in America. I don't know what it takes to get back to that place in Washington, D.C., but we all need to work overtime trying to get back there because that, that was stellar. 10,000 
diseases and 500 cures, and we tackled the problem with your help and Chairman Upton's help, the whole committee pulled together. And then we find ourselves in a cantankerous uh, effort like we are here today. Dr. Gupta, it's clear that everyone on this panel wants to ensure that prescription drugs are affordable for all who need them. While we may strongly disagree on how to achieve the goal, there is bipartisan agreement that the Part D program can be improved. A redesigned benefit, which protects beneficiaries from high drug spending, is included in both HR 3 and HR 19. I hope that we can seize on this rare bipartisan opportunity to get these important benefit improvements signed into law this year and not get bogged down in a partisan fight over other drug pricing reform. Can you please elaborate on why it is important to cap beneficiaries out of pocket costs in Part D? Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Capping out of pocket costs is the key to ensuring access, ultimately, um, as well as, of course, incentivizing that new drugs are created. But, um, you know, patient out of pocket costs in 2019 were about $82 billion. Uh, and we know that, you know, 25% of patients will walk away when out of pocket costs are above $50. So it is important to, uh, to, to eliminate those barriers to access. I, uh, I've heard from my colleagues on the other side of the aisle about the enormous profits that the biomedical industry purportedly reaps at the expense of patients. But many of the same companies, especially smaller startups in places like California and New York, are enormous job creators and constantly reinvesting their revenues into research and development and cutting edge jobs. Uh, Dr. Gupta, Gupta, could you uh, please speak? a little more to how HR 3's policies might impact the vibrant biotech job growth sector, not only in Silicon Valley, but in the rest of the country. And would you say that many of these jobs could move overseas if HR 3 were enacted? Yeah, well, thank you. I'd like to start by reminding ourselves that the 1.4% of GDP that we spend on branded drugs, we get a lot of bang for the buck, not only in the improved health outcomes, but uh, the output of our sector was over a trillion dollars and then we employ over 800,000 workers in biopharma. One third of those are in key STEM occupations and most of the workers are highly mobile, highly desirable workers uh, for any industry. If uh, HR3 and, and price controls are set in, in a way that, um, you know, it has the deleterious effects of the industry that we all think it would, I could see an impact on the economic, uh, significant impact on the economic output of the sector affecting jobs, of course, in California, Massachusetts, New York, New Jersey, and across the country where the sector is, you know, employs people. Um, I don't know if somebody's not muted or what, but uh, I'm on also on the telecom subcommittee, and I think I need to get to work on that uh, as much as you were breaking up there on my end. So if anyone's not on mute, you might want to hit mute there. Uh, Dr. Gupta, sticking with you here, your testimony emphasizes much of the biotech advances being made in China in recent years. It seems they are already nipping at our heels and see biotech as an industry of enormous strategic importance. How do you expect China's strategy to change if HR3 becomes law? Well, I, I think we have tremendous advantages uh, today in the United States because of the NIH, our tremendous public science funding, our tremendous university system. Um, the only way China will ever catch up, uh, the only way we'll ever fall behind is if we do it to ourselves. Um, so my sense, you know, I'm not an expert on China's policies or how they might react. My sense is that they would, you know, really lean in on trying to catch up um, and uh, trying to siphon as much of the talent, as much of the IP um, and as much of the know-how as they can um, in, a, in a very defined way. And if HR3 were to become law, would it be as simple as flipping a switch to turn our biotechnology system back on if all of this investment does move to China and other countries? Probably not a simple switch. I, I think that um, we have tremendous advantages here, such as the NIH and the public university system that we can always rely on and we can always, you know, go back to that well to uh, reclaim our leadership advantage. I hope that everyone got to see 60 Minutes on Sunday with uh, China's uh, chip development and our lack of chip development. I don't want to see that go into the drug drug phase. I'm over time here, Madam Chair, and thank you for having a uh, great hearing here today. <clears throat> and with that, I yield back. Uh, the gentleman yields back. And uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Long, for highlighting 
what the um, uh, biotechnology industry represents in our country, certainly in my congressional district. It's a great source of pride to anyone that uh, represents them because of the innovation that they produce. In fact, um, uh, for big pharma, uh, the big companies look for innovation uh, to the biotechnology industry and um, and acquire uh, them for um, because of their innovation. So thank you. Uh, the chair now uh, has the pleasure to recognize the gentleman from ca uh, California, uh, Mr. Cardenas, uh, followed by uh, Mr. Uh, Mark Wayne uh, Mullen of Oklahoma. So you recognize Tony for five minutes. Great to see you. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and I appreciate uh, you and Ranking Member Guthrie for holding this important hearing. And thank you uh, to all the witnesses for your expertise and opinions today. Uh, we know that lowering prescription drug costs is a priority for our all Americans, and I think that lowering uh, healthcare costs overall is a priority as well. Uh, even before the pandemic, one in four Americans reportedly reported difficulty affording their medications. Our current economic reality has only made it worse. Uh, as the wealthiest country in the world, the high cost of prescription drugs is unjust and for too uh, long, and uh, it literally has become a matter of life and death in, for many families and many children. No one should be forced to ration or avoid taking medications due to whether or not they can afford it. Uh, this is not what, what Americans or any person deserves, and I'm glad that uh, our committee is working on this solution uh, to address it today. And I hope that we can continue this fight to address the other 90% of costs that Americans are concerned about when it comes to healthcare overall. And as we prioritize affordability for patients and families, it's also important that we ensure research, development, production of existing and new medicines can continue to make it to market so that we can have more cures and more lives saved and also the quality of life of Americans uh, is improved. Uh, Ms. Ball, uh, again, thank you so much for your testimony today and for sharing such a personal story, not only about yourself, but about the people you care for. Can you please expand on what it uh, felt like for you to know this about patients who are rationing their care or can't, who can't afford um, to get the care that they need uh, because of prices? And uh, what, what, what does it mean to you? What it meant to me is that um, not only did I have difficulty with my uh, memory and my physical um, being, I also had to stop nursing. And that was the love of my life. So that was huge. It also is what I see is all my um, fellow advocates, people that I have run into in special groups. They are past the point of how, what they can do. Their disease is progressing at a rapid pace and they are not able to get their drugs. I think that we need to look at this, as you have said, that we need to get this bill passed in order for us to save the people in the United States with MS alone. I'm sure it's affecting almost every disease, those that are disabled, and also for the rare diseases. So it is something that needs to be dealt with. You can't imagine the one, one point what, 1.1 1 .1 billion people will, will die from the fact that they didn't in the next decade for not receiving their medications. People in the United States should not, one, depend on charity to get their, their drugs, and people in the United States should be able to take care of themselves without having to depend on either charities or do I get my medicine or do I get my groceries? It is Thank imperative you. that we take this and we take it for the fact Thank that you. it's for all of us. Thank you, Ms. Ball. Um, some bills we're discussing today involve biosimilars biologics that are similar to other already Food and Drug Administration approved biologic medicines. I believe biosimilars play a role in helping lower prescription drug costs for patients across the board. Uh, that's why I've reintroduced the Increasing Access to Biosimilars Act. By authorizing a Medicare pilot program, this bill would help encourage physicians to prescribe less expensive biosimilars, promoting healthy competition and increasing patient access to life-saving prescription drugs by making it more affordable for them. Professor Sachs, could you please discuss your thoughts on biosimilars and how they could help increase affordability for patients and families? Absolutely, and biosimilars and generic small molecule drugs are a key part of the social bargain. 
that we've made with drug companies where we give them exclusive rights, patents and FDA exclusivity periods, but we expect that at some point competition through biosimilars and generics will enter and increase affordability for patients, increase our system affordability and drive down prices. And the U.S. has yet to realize the full promise of biosimilar competition. And it is very important to consider bills that would increase biosimilar competition in the U.S. as biosimilar competition in Europe is quite ahead of us and by quite some margin. Well, one of the things that, that I have a problem comparing us to Europe is that uh, the United States uh, invests more money in R&D in this field than they do in Europe. In addition to that, uh, in the United States, we have more talent, thank God. And the reason why we have more talent is because somehow, some way, we've been able to create that environment. Hopefully, uh, the, we don't have a negative effect on that uh, when we're trying to correct this issue of drug pricing in America. Uh, my time has expired. I'm sorry, Madam Chair. I yield back. Uh, the gentleman yields back. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, recognize the gentleman from Oklahoma, um, uh, Mark Wayne uh, Mullen, and uh, uh, we all hope that your son continues to make the progress that he has been making, which is really miraculous. And uh, uh, and uh, he will be followed by uh, Dr. Uh, Ruiz uh, from California. So uh, you have your five minutes for questioning. Well, thank you, Chairman Eshing. Thank you for always being concerned about my son. It's ironic because we're talking about drug pricing and um, one thing that I, I had to point out that my son, he has to take a shot every um, every week or every day, I'm sorry, and it costs about $4,900 a month now because of the insurance. Wow. And, uh, you know, sometimes the insurance pays, sometimes the insurance doesn't. And uh, it's, a, it's tough for my wife and I, uh, much less thinking about with my son, who is 17 now, uh, what he's going to do. I mean, when my wife and I got married, I was 19 and she was 18 and we were making $500 a week combined. <laughs> I mean, it was, it, you know, we were just barely able to get by and to just think you're going to uh, handcuff, literally handcuff someone like that. And so when we're talking about drug prices, I understand it. I get it. it, it it's it's something real to us and we're, we're, we're having to deal with it. I, I but I, I still have a, a little bit of a hard time with HR three. When you start thinking about HR three, it's, it's government takeover of healthcare. Uh, and because when government gets into setting prices, then they are telling the manufacturers, which is a independent from the federal government, uh, they're entrepreneurs. It's what the United States thrive on, thrives on, not government takeover, but of entrepreneurship. When you start telling them how much they can charge, it is. It does affect. Uh, it does affect what they do and what they're willing to invest in because they're going to be capped on their on what they're able to to get reimbursed for. Whereas my opinion is, it, it, we should be looking at what's prohibiting competition from coming into the market? What's prohibiting individuals from entering the market? Why are we seeing a consolidation of pharmaceutical companies? Uh, because it, with more competition, we would, we, we, we would see prices come down because they're going to be competing for our pricing. They're going to be competing for our business. If you're talking about insulin, uh, um, insulin or you're talking about the, 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 the shot that my son has to take every night, uh, because there's only one manufacturer that makes my son's shot too. Uh, and so there's no market. It's either take it or leave it. Uh, Dr. Gupta, I hope I'm saying that right. I know we have all been using different names <laughs> to get to, but I, Dr. Gupta is, Gupta, is that how is that how you pronounce it? Yes, Congressman. Thank you. Uh, would you agree that innovation is uh, is is the best way to in a market to control uh, pricing? Well, I think that that's exactly right, and I think there's a couple of different uh, aspects to it. You know, as I as I've mentioned, I, you know, the the value we get from good prescription drugs by pharmaceutical purchasing, um, in terms of improved health outcomes, is is second to none. We have to remember that um, these drugs that we're talking about keep people out of the hospital, thereby saving co overall healthcare costs. And I think that's an important point. Um, to remember. And I think, you know, tying into, you know, your, your comments just a moment ago, when these drugs go generic, when there is competition, we as a society save over $200 billion a year with $2 trillion a decade. And I think that's exactly the phenomenon that you were referring to. So is it fair to say then that modernizing uh, and recalibrating the natural price control, like the generic drug pricing would help protect innovation and, and control pricing a little bit better then? 
it would not it would not just protect it, uh, sir. It would actually stimulate it. You know, the the generic uh, genericization of medicines is not only a natural price control; it actually stimulates innovative biopharma companies to develop new medicines. Um, and as an investor, that's that's a process that we support. Right. Um, I I, uh, I appreciate that. So, with 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 government control in a market, uh, does that does that do you feel like that really creates more burden? regulations that would prohibit uh, new companies from entering into the market then? I think we uh, can all agree that we should be limiting uh, barriers to generic competitors. Um, I think there's been good ideas posited on that. Um, and I wanted to make a quick comment in this regard on biosimilars. I mean, I see evidence of successful biosimilar entry in the U.S. as well. Um, you know, biosimilars for drugs such as Avastin and Herceptin now have 50% market share. The originator company in those cases have started to offer discounts, and that's natural price control in action. Right. Well, listen, uh, I appreciate your time, uh, Chairman or Chairwoman Eshun. Thank you for always being concerned. Thanks for bringing this together too, because I do, I do agree with a lot of my colleagues. There is room here for us to work on, and I think this affects all of our lives. And there's a lot of opportunity. I just I, I really wish we had a more bipartisan approach. Uh, HR three, I don't think we really had a whole lot of say in. It's almost been like the you know the committee's going to take it or leave it, and I, this committee's had a history of working together. Um, and, and ever since we've been on it, we've had a history of working together. And I know you want to work with us. I know there's other people across the aisle that wants to work with us. And so I hope I hope this is the beginning of us actually looking for a solution to have HR three work for all of us, Republicans and Democrats alike. So with that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Mullen, and uh, thank you for always sharing your story uh, with us. Uh, the American people are tuned in uh, to these hearings. Um, I think they sometimes have a, uh, uh, you know, a picture that is not quite accurate about individual members of Congress. Um, you know, the vulnerabilities in our families, what takes place in our lives. Uh, it's like holding a mirror up to the country. So uh, I salute you for that. It's a, it really is very important. Uh, uh, the chair is um, uh, pleased to recognize uh, one of the doctors on our committee, Dr. Ruiz of California, followed by uh, one of our pharmacists in the Congress, uh, Mr. Carter from uh, Georgia. So you're recognized, uh, uh, Dr. Ruiz, for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much for holding a hearing on this very important issue. And thank you to our witnesses for being here today. Uh, during debate over the drug, drug pricing policies and how Congress should address access and affordability, it is important to remember why we are having this debate in the first place, which is the patient. Unfortunately, the patient and the importance of access to health and life-giving medication sometimes gets lost in the shuffle. But that is exactly what the core of this debate needs to be about. It's about the dad who can't afford the medication for his child and has to decide every month whether to cut corners on food for the family or medicine for his child. It's about the mom who is working two jobs to help pay for her aging mother's medicine while also paying for health care for her kids. It's about my patient who told me once that she collected cans to help pay for her insulin and told me that she figured out a way to afford her medicine by only taking half of the dosage to make it last longer, which makes her medicine, of course, ineffective. The average American often cannot afford their medication, even if they have insurance, even if they have Medicare. So seniors and families all across America are rationing their medications or going without them completely because they simply cost too much. And I know I'm hearing about it from my constituents, and I'm sure that everyone up here on the dais is hearing similar stories. For example, David, a senior from Beaumont, California, in my district, contacted my office recently to tell me about the heart medication his doctors wants to prescribe, of which there are no generic alternatives. The medication is so expensive that after the first three months of the year, David goes into the donor hole, where he will remain for the rest of the year, paying 3290 Four dollars in nine months just for his heart medications. For seniors living on a fixed income, this not affordable and is not acceptable. Individuals and their doctors should choose a treatment based on what is best for the health of the patient, not primarily on whether the patient can afford to pay for the drug out of pocket. 
This system is unacceptable. America can and must do better. And it is time we do something about it. Healthcare is a right for everyone and access to prescription medication should not be reserved as a privilege only for the wealthy few. Professor Sachs, thank you again for your testimony. There's a lot of discussion about the most effective way to bring down drug prices, including allowing the secretaries of HHS to negotiate prices directly with manufacturers, much like the VA does. So HR3 requires the secretary to negotiate at least 25 of the most expensive sole source drugs in the first year, and at least 50 each year after that, as well as insulin. Would you agree that negotiating eligible drugs is the most effective way to deliver the greatest amount of savings and best use of resources? And do you think that HR 3's mechanism for selecting drugs for negotiation provide the most, quote, bang for our buck? HR 3 certainly seems to be designed to provide the most bang for our negotiating buck. So the secretary is explicitly told to select for negotiation the drugs the secretary thinks will result in the greatest savings to either the federal government or beneficiaries throughout the relevant period. And it makes sense to phase in the program and start with the subset of drugs that's likely to deliver the most savings before expanding. Thank you. And, and let's translate that to what it means for the patient. So CBO estimates that prices could be reduced by up to 55% for the first set of drugs negotiated by the secretary. So what, what impact would those price reductions have on healthcare out-of-pocket costs for the patient? Well, as the physician, you're, you're an expert certainly, but the CBO has said that if patients are more easily able to afford their prescription drugs, then they'll take those prescription drugs. And in at least some conditions, they will have lower overall health care costs. If you can avoid hospitalizing a patient because they're taking their medication on, the, on a regular basis, that's very important and it can lower health care costs overall. Thank you very much. You know, this is so important for our nation. It's not fair that America has to pay three times as much as other countries on the exact same medication. So America can and must do better. And I think everybody... Uh, for being here today, and I yield back my time. Uh, the gentleman yields back. The chair is pleased to recognize the gentleman from uh, Georgia, Mr. Carter, followed by our colleague, uh, Congresswoman Debbie Dingell of Michigan. So you're recognized, buddy. Five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank all of you for being here to the witnesses. And you know, as a, as a pharmacist for over 30 years, this is this is the one issue that has frustrated me more than any other issue that I've tried to work on while I've been a member of Congress, because the answer is, is so simple and it's so clear. The problem to me, from my, from my perspective, is, is the vertical integration that exists within our healthcare system. When you have the insurance company that owns the PBM, that owns the pharmacy, you have a vertical integration there by which any time you squeeze that balloon, the only thing that's going to happen is it's going to go somewhere else. And that's what's happening here. Dr. Gupta, you, you referenced PBMs and the problems that they had in, in your opening testimony. And that is the problem. I know I'm a pharmacist. I, I was a a retail pharmacist, an independent retail pharmacist. I'm the one who signed the front of the paychecks. I had to make the, the, the numbers work, and I know where the problem is. And the problem right now is that you have three PBMs that are all owned by insurance companies. It, someone made the point, I believe it was you, Dr. Gupta, that, that, the, 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 that prescription drug prices are only a small percentage of the total health care costs. And they are, but the problem is... The reason that prescription drug prices are so high is because when you have Aetna that owns Caremark that owns CVS, when you have Cigna that owns Express Scripts, PBM, that owns Express Scripts, mail order pharmacy, which, oh, by the way, is the second busiest in terms of volume in the nation. When you have United, which has the insurance, the PBM, and the pharmacy as well, then you have three, P three PBMs that own that cover over 70% of the market. There is no competition there. And, and, and there is, that is what has got to be broken up. And yet we tend in Congress to try to attack it from different perspectives. 
And then we have a bill like H.R. 3. I appreciate and I applaud you, Madam Chair, and I applaud the majority party as well as the minority party for trying to address this problem. But this is going to hurt more than it's going to help. I tell the story all the time. When I first started practicing pharmacy in 1980, if you were diagnosed with hepatitis C, it meant you were going to die because we didn't have a cure for it. Now, through research and development by the, by the pharmaceutical manufacturers, you can take a single pill and be cured of it. That is nothing short of phenomenal. However, if that single pill costs $85,000 and you can't afford it, it does you no good whatsoever. The problem is we've got to break up that monopoly, that vertical integration. Dr. Guth, I want to ask you, do you, how important do you think this issue is in saving, in, in saving patients would have if PBMs were held accountable, if the middleman who bring no value whatsoever to the, to the healthcare system, if they were made to be transparent and accountable? Well, Congressman, I agree with you more. Uh, there, is, there is consolidation in the PBM um, industry and, the, and in general among prescription drug middlemen. In fact, uh, of what we spend on prescription branded drugs, only 53% is estimated to actually make it back to manufacturers. So the middlemen are not just taking a small cut, they're taking in many cases a substantial cut. Uh, and transparency is key. I'm sorry, Dr. Good, but what are they doing with that 47%? Are they putting it back in the research and development? At least the pharmaceutical manufacturers are putting it back in the research and development. You're right, Congressman. I think that you know the, the middlemen have, have uh, consolidated, and, and three um, three entities have really outsized market power right now because they represent such a vast proportion of, of lives. And, and the, the, my concern with HR three is, is it's going to stifle innovation. I mentioned I, I mentioned hepatitis, and and I mentioned all the other things that I've seen. Nothing short of miracles come out of research and development over my many years of practice in pharmacy. I think about my friends that that suffer and that have family members who suffer from Alzheimer's. Right now, there are currently estimated to be almost six million Americans with Alzheimer's. But by 2050. The Americans age 65 and older with Alzheimer's is projected to be as high as 14 million. We've had 146 unsuccessful attempts to develop medicines to treat Alzheimer's. Dr. Good, what's, what's HR3 going to do to research and development for potential cures for Alzheimer's? I think it could be done. Not just Alzheimer's disease, uh, ALS, and, and similar diseases where we haven't unfortunately made very much progress. Uh, we continue to try, we continue to take the bets and pour resources into them, but eliminating the potential for, uh, you know, incentivizing that innovation, I think could be devastating. Madam Chair, I appreciate your indulgence. I'm just telling you, the solution is simple. It's right before us and we're not getting it. We're not understanding that it's right. All we gotta do is break up this vertical integration that exists within the healthcare system. If we break it up, we can do something about prescription drug prices. We can do something about health care costs. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'll yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Carter. And um, uh, I agree with you on the issue of PBMs. I, I really think that we miss an opportunity uh, uh, to uh, for a very important reform, and I've held that view for some time. So thank you for your consistent passion about that. Uh, the chair had now has the pleasure to recognize uh, the gentlewoman from Michigan, a name that is honored over decades in the Congress, uh, Congresswoman Dingell, uh, followed by one of our distinguished doctors on the committee, Dr. Neil Dunn of Florida will follow her. Uh, Debbie, you're recognized, five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> and, um, my heart is with um, my pharmacist colleague do. We do need to talk about that. But I don't want to draw attention from some of the issues that we're talking about today. And Ranking Member Guthrie, thank you too, because this hearing is just so important because so many of us have constituents who simply can't afford their medicine. We've heard some arguments here today that if HR3 were to become law, then there's a likelihood that innovation would be driven to China. I think that this is a red herring, let's be clear, because absolutely nothing in HR3 is closing the U.S. market for drug manufacturers or drug development. 
The fact is that the United States is the largest pharmaceutical market in the world, and the pharmaceutical industry relies heavily on the premium academic institutions in the United States for their R&D work. There's no reason to believe HR3 will fundamentally alter this dynamic. Innovation occurs where the best science is done, and the best science happens here in the United States of America. And there's no doubt that the U.S. will continue to be the world's leader in funding for basic medical science, and HR3 provides additional resources to NIH to maintain our nation's role as a global leader in innovation. So Professor Sachs and Professor Carrier, we've heard claims today that China can run clinical trials faster than U.S. counterparts. But does that mean they're better? Americans expect that the drugs that they and their families are going to take should meet rigorous review standards in order to ensure they are safe and effective. Could you agree that the Food and Drug Administration is the gold standard for drug approvals in the world? And whichever one of you wants to go first. Yes, I, I do think that the US FDA is the gold standard for the world. I agree Professor completely. Sachs? Additionally, Professor Sachs and Professor Carrier, isn't it fair to say that China pays relatively low prices for drugs? Why would we expect the Chinese market have greater innovation potential than the United States? That's absolutely correct. China pays lower prices for drugs than we do. And I think you put it well when you said that innovation occurs where the best science is done, not where the drug prices are the highest. Professor Carrier, any comments? Sure. So I, I think that one issue that we haven't talked enough about is the type of innovation that would be affected by HR3. So we're not talking about that many drugs. It's only eight to 15 fewer drugs out of a total of 300, according to the studies. And if you look at the type of drugs here, they're not the most revolutionary drugs. So for example, there is one study that just came out that looked at 122 ultra expensive drugs in Medicare, annual spending of 63,000 a year, and found that 73 to 85% of them have no or low additional added value. And so when we're talking about this, we're not talking about the blockbuster drugs, we're talking about a lot of me too drugs. Well, let me ask you about that, because I hear from my constituents about the high cost of older drugs like abuterol. I mean, everybody on the committee knows that I cannot get the story of the mother out of my head who has to pay $800 for an inhaler. And so, for example, inhalers to treat asthma can cost hundreds of dollars, but they're decade old drugs. Professor Sexton, Professor Carey, how will the HR3 framework incentivize new innovative frontline treatments rather than the older Me Too drugs that you just discussed? Well, it will force ph pharma to create new innovations. Pharma has played all sorts of anti-competitive games and they've relied on those games and they've relied on charging whatever price they want in the U.S. So they don't have to do quite as much innovation. Sure, innovation in the revolutionary kind is hard, but to the extent you can rely on these tricks that have gotten you this to this point, then there's no need to go beyond that. I agree. If you, yes, my apologies. I, I agree. If you look at the top selling drugs in Medicare right now, Part B and Part D, most of them are over a decade old. These are drugs that have recouped their investment and have had plenty of protected time on the market. Uh, negotiating for the prices of these drugs won't harm innovation in the future. It'll make space for future innovation in just the way Professor Carrier said. Thank you both, Madam Chair. With 12 seconds left, I guess I'll yield those back. Gentlemen, uh, yield back. Uh, the uh, it's a pleasure to recognize uh, Dr. Dunn of Florida, uh, and he'll be followed by our colleague uh, Congresswoman Custer. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dunn, you're recognized. Thanks Thank for you your very patience. much, Madam Chair. Thanks for your patience. No, no, I appreciate your uh, having this hearing. You know, we all know that the policies we make in Washington can have trade-offs, both good and bad. But any policy that will choke off investment in, in an entire industry and an industry that's in the business of making cures is, is bad policy. I want to associate myself with Dr. Gupta's testimony. I think we're living in a truly fascinating age of medicine and cancer treatments, gene therapies, 
CAR T therapies, monoclonal antibody treatments, and many more are in development or recently hit the market. Uh, and we all want Americans to have access to these new innovative cures. Americans already have access to more cures than do the citizens of the nations that HR3 seeks to tie our drug prices to. Uh, why take a step backwards and restrict access to cures for sick Americans? Uh, the quality of life metrics, so-called qualities or quality adjusted life years, are built into the prices of some of our European friends pay for their prescription drugs. Uh, by these calculations, a treatment that extends the life of a disabled patient is worth less than a treatment for a young, healthy patient. This is not an attitude we should be importing, and it flies in the face of the American Disabilities Act. In Florida, the estimated impact of HR3 is a loss of nearly $7 billion in economic output, 30,000 jobs, many of them at small and medium-sized biotech companies, uh, and, and doing clinical research. HR3 is an industry-killing proposal at a time when so many cures are on the horizon, and it is strikingly short-sighted in the wake of a global pandemic. Uh, to be clear, I think Americans should have access to the kinds of cures I'm talking about at an affordable price. We all want the prices to come down. I associate myself with uh, Buddy Carter's remarks on that. But let's not destroy the American pharmaceutical industry and stifle innovation in the process. Uh, H.R. 19, the Lower Cost, More Cures Act, is full of bipartisan provisions to achieve just that. Fully 17 of these provisions were signed into law last year after careful bipartisan consideration. We passed transparency, reclassified insulin as a biologic, improved generic meds, et cetera. Uh, 40 more bipartisan provisions are included in the HR 19 bill this Congress. And it pro includes provisions to reduce out-of-pocket costs, learn more about the cost of middlemen in the pharmaceutical industry, combat shady practices, extending patents, et cetera. I am disappointed uh, by the short-sighted effort to control prices at the cost of trade-offs that are just too harmful to patients suffering from many diseases. Dr. Gupta, I'd like to direct my questions to you. We just witnessed uh, the incredible speed at which vaccines were developed in COVID. Can you think of any country on HR3's international reference price list that produced and delivered multiple COVID vaccines to market? over the last year? And do you relate that to the relative capabilities of the pharmaceutical industries in those countries before the pandemic arrived? Absolutely, thank you, Congressman. I think it's important to recognize that, for instance, there were certain therapies such as uh, dexamethasone, which was a generic drug, which ended up being effective. Perhaps we would have been able to develop the monoclonal antibodies, I think we would have, um, that serve for acute patients. And certain types of the vaccines, including the adenovirus vaccines, may have been developed as well. But the mRNA vaccines, I think it's important to recognize that it was biotech investment over the preceding several years that laid the foundation that allowed them to be positioned to rapidly develop uh, an effective vaccine in under, in under uh, a year. Uh, Thank you. Let me, let me charge ahead with our limited time. Dr. Gupta, again, uh, you know, it takes 10, 15 years for new treatment to make it through the pipeline. There are currently over 250 cell and gene therapies in early clinical stage trials, 17 for ALS, 16 for MS, and 300 for rare pediatric diseases. What happens to these potential cures if HR3 is signed into law? And do you think the manufacturers will pursue approval for these drugs if HR3 is enacted? I think some of them may. I think some of them will look to try to do the math and realize that there's no longer an argument to be made to pursue it. I think that the, the longer stream danger is that it'll close up the funnel at the top end. Um, and we might never get to 1,000, 2,000, or 10,000 cell and gene therapies in the pipeline, which is where we should be headed. Good. So, you know, I want to relate a, a quote from an Australian physician in the last few seconds here. He, he said, I disagree with government decisions often because I want to use a medication which is shown to be a benefit and is a standard of care in the United States and I just can't use it. That was by an Australian hematologist. This is what we risk if we go down the path of HR3. Uh, why on earth would we want to impart these frustrating, tragic stories to our practices? Uh, with that, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you again for having this important hearing. We thank the gentleman uh, and he yields back. Uh, the chair is pleased to recognize uh, a good friend to all of us, the gentlewoman uh, from uh, New Hampshire, uh, Ms. Custer, be uh, followed by 
Uh, Mr. Curtis of Utah. Annie, you're recognized for your five minutes of questions. Thank you so much, Chairwoman Eshoo, for holding this important hearing today to discuss legislation to lower the cost of prescription drugs for the American people. For too long, Americans have been grappling with the skyrocketing costs of prescription drugs and the current direct trajectory for what Americans, and particularly seniors on Medicare Part D, pay is simply unsustainable and the status quo is unacceptable. For years, since I began running for Congress, I've been calling on Medicare to be able to negotiate the price of prescription drugs, a policy that has broad support amongst the American people and would generate literally billions of dollars in savings. So I am so pleased to see this provision included in the Elijah Cummings Lower Drug Cost Now Act. Legislative reforms to how we price drugs and medication in America should be a nonpartisan issue. It doesn't matter what your party affiliation is or where you live. Americans in every corner of our country are seeing more and more of their hard-earned dollars go toward prescription drugs and life-saving treatments. And that's why I am so pleased to partner with my friend and colleague, Republican Congressman David McKinley, on bipartisan legislation to create billions in savings for Medicare Part D beneficiaries. Last week, we introduced the Ensuring Access to Lower Cost Medicines for Seniors Act, which aims to ensure Medicare beneficiaries receive the full benefit of affordable generic drugs. The placement of generic and biosimilar medicines in the same pricing tier as more expensive brand drugs has led to seniors paying more out-of-pocket costs for their medicine. Our bipartisan bill seeks to reverse this trend by ensuring automatic coverage of lower-cost generic medications immediately after launch and the creation of a dedicated specialty tier for specialty generics that offer lower-cost sharing for seniors. The Ensuring Access to Lower Cost Medicines for Seniors Act could save seniors $4 billion per year through reforms to how generics and biosimilars are covered. And I want to thank Chairwoman Eshoo for including this bipartisan bill in today's hearing. Ms. Sachs, thank you for your testimony and for describing how some of the misaligned incentives are, it is how Medicare Part D operates. In your opinion, does Medicare Part D's design currently incentivize the coverage of brand name drugs, even when lower cost generic medicines might be available? I would agree that there are elements of the Part D design which contribute to this, but it's also really about the relationships between the Part D plans and the PBMs as well. So thank you. Several Part D plans offer more favorable formulary placements to branded drugs than they do to lower priced generics. Would the creation of a separate specialty tier for generic drugs in Part D have the possibility of lowering out-of-pocket -poc costs for seniors? It would absolutely have the possibility of doing that. And the reason is that today, a lot of seniors' out-of-pocket costs are based on the list price of the drugs even if the negotiated net price is much lower than that. And so giving them those generic prices would be very helpful. And what do you have any sense of what the savings could be for seniors across this country? I, I don't. That would be a question for a CBO. But more generally, you're right to say that this is the type of bill which responds to some of the misaligned incentives, particularly involving the PBM insurance plan relationship. Great. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And Madam Chair, let the record reflect. I yield back with a minute to go. You go. Thank you. The gentlewoman uh, yields back. Uh, pleasure to recognize the gentleman from Utah, uh, Mr. Curtis, followed by uh, our colleague, Ms. Barragan from California. So you're recognized uh, for five minutes, Mr. Curtis. Nice to thank see you. Thank you. Yes, very good to see you. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's been a very great uh, hearing. Appreciate the comments of all of my colleagues. And uh, I, I'd particularly like to associate myself with the representative who uh, referred to this as good stuff. Uh, it's a great way to describe it. Uh, Mr. Gupta, I love to brag about the startup uh, economy here in Utah, which is largely responsible for us uh, being on the forefront of economic development and, and recovery. 
I'm aware of 20 startup biotech companies. They're working on cures for deadly diseases like COVID-19 and rare forms of cancer. To bring this home in Utah alone, it's estimated that HR3 would result in the loss of nearly 20,000 jobs and a loss of over $4 billion in economic output. My experience tells me that regulations like we're looking at in HR3 are disproportionately hard, hard and hurt smaller businesses. Can you share how you feel smaller startup biotech companies would access funding uh, in or, uh, that they need in order to do the drug discovery and eventually drug development if HR3 becomes law? Uh, I'd be delighted to, Congressman, and that's particularly the, the intersection of, uh, of biotechnology and finance in which I, I find myself, uh, which is to say that um, reminding ourselves that it's smaller biotech companies that are primarily charged with bringing innovative products forward and represent about 70% of innovative drugs in phase three today. With, with uh, price controls, I think that uh, the smaller biotech companies will be disproportionately impacted, which is why the um, the overall impact on innovation will be high. Uh, there, there might be large organizations that will have other access to uh, capital um, or be able to reprioritize, you know, um, from large budgets, but uh, but small biotech companies will be very vulnerable to this legislation. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Davis, while we were all touched by your story of Hunter, I'm told that many companies have patient assistant programs that help patients pay for cost of medications at little uh, or actually no cost. They also have cost sharing programs to insist, assist the insured patients pay for out-of-pocket costs. I'm curious, have you or any of your families you know benefited from these programs? Yes, in my uh, testimony, I discussed Ben, which participated in a free drug patient assistance program. I also know a number of patients that participate in uh, patient assistance programs that pro provide assistance towards their co-pays, deductibles, and co-assurance, which have uh, risen so high in recent years. Um, and sadly, insurers have enacted copay accumulator programs, which make the benefits of patient assistance programs um, really inapplicable to patients. Yeah, uh, thank you. And quickly, Dr. Gupta, could, as a follow-up, uh, is it fair to say that if HR3 is enacted, this charity care would, would be among the first things that would see go away? Uh, you know, Congressman, I haven't contemplated that in the past, and uh, I think I'd have to get back to you, actually. Okay, I, I would love to know that. Okay. Um, let me also point out, Dr. Gupta, we know these rare diseases, they strike in an unpredictable and like very cruel way. And uh, as an example, I I've lost three neighbors, and by neighbors, I'm talking within two blocks of my home to ALS over the last uh, several years. And currently, an another neighbor and a very close friend of mine uh, is uh, an ALS patient. Fortunately, he has the resources to enroll in clinical trials for exper experimental therapies to treat his ALS. And quite frankly, he credits these trials for the very, very slow progression of the disease, which is unusual. If HR3 were to pass, there are studies that indicate that there would be a 90% reduction in drugs developed by smaller biotech companies over the next de decade, some of which could help AS ALS patients. Do you share the same belief that HR3 would lead to reductions in competition and overall reductions in drug development? Absolutely. And I, I think it's uh, something that we heard earlier was that the types of drugs that would be eliminated would be primarily non-innovative drugs. I don't agree with that. I think that the types of drugs we would lose out on would be the most innovative, uh, the most risky. And for the diseases where we've made the least progress, and that includes ALS, uh, Parkinson's, and Alzheimer's disease. Yes. And just in the few seconds I have left, uh, can you explain the impact of HR3 on clinical trials uh, that have helped my friend and, and good people Jeffrey. like Ms. Davis? Nice, man. Very briefly, I would say that I think it will reduce the incentive to fund clinical trials, which are expensive, and therefore reduce the number of innovative medicines available via clinical trials. Very good. And uh, Madam Chair, thank you very much. I yield my time. Uh, the gentleman yields back. Uh, it's a pleasure to recognize our colleague from California, uh, Ms. Barragan, uh, followed by 
uh, one of our distinguished doctors on the committee, Dr. Joyce of Pennsylvania. So um, you're recognized, uh, Annette, great to see you. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Eshoo, uh, for holding this important hearing on legislation to lower prescription drug prices, including HR3. The last Congress, we took some of the savings from this bill and reinvested them to expand Medicare. I hope that we decide to do that again, and this time to expand things like access to dental coverage for Medicare beneficiaries. Two thirds of seniors and individuals with disabilities in the Medicare program do not have oral health coverage. Often times uh, these individuals are living on a fixed income and beneficiary struggle to be able to afford and receive a uh, dental care. I currently have a bill, the dental, uh, the Medicare Dental Benefit Act, which is HR 502, which would expand Medicare Part B benefits to cover dental and oral health services, including things like routine cleanings, exams, fillings, crowns, major services such as root canals and extractions, emergency dental care, and other necessary services. I'm hopeful that my bill, as well as other proposals by my colleagues um, to expand Medicare services can be considered as we move forward. Uh, now, I wanna talk a little bit about labeling exclusivity. You know, in addition to HR3, today we consider my legislation to bring more competition to the drug market. The bill is called the Prompt Approval of Safe Generic Drugs Act. We know that as more generic drugs come into the market, prices drop dramatically. However, throughout our system, small hurdles remain for generic competition. And my bill addresses one example of how we can address that. Under current law, generics can be blocked from entering the market if safety information on a brand's drug label is protected under exclusivity, but no other hurdles remain. My bill would create a path forward for generic competition in these instances by allowing the Food and Drug Administration to attach a statement of an appropriate safety information to the generic drugs label to assure safe use. My bill stands for something quite simple. Safety information should be a feature of drug labels, not a bar to competition. Now, the FDA supports this legislation and the CBO recognizes this is a problem, estimating that fixing it would save $164 million. Professor Carrier, I recognize this is just one issue we are discussing here today, but can you discuss how regulatory issues like this can promote competition and lower drug prices for consumers? Yes, yes I can. So thank, you, thank you for the question. And you're absolutely right that this is an important issue. There are many ways in which generics are not able to enter the market. And you put those all together and American consumers suffer because they're not able to afford their drugs. And so I appreciate your leadership on this piece of legislation. You're right that generics should be able to enter the market if the only thing that's blocking them is the label from the brand company. And so this would be one piece of legislation that could bring generics to the market faster. Great, thank you. Um, another issue that we've been hearing a lot about today is uh, just let the market do its thing and that will uh, that will take care of itself. And that hasn't happened. That hasn't worked. This is that's why Congress has to step in and do something. Um, just taking a look at things like insulin, uh, where it started and where it's gone, um, is a good example of why we need HR three and why we need action. Um, communities of color, including uh, my community, that has a very high uh, rate of diabetes. It's uh, my district is almost ninety percent Latino, African American, low income, have really high rates. Uh, Professor Sachs, what will be the impact for diabetics, especially communities of color, if insulin prices are negotiated? It could be very significant for health and for uh, closing health disparities because we have these decades old drugs whose prices continue to rise year after year, seemingly without justification. So by lowering those prices, we can improve adherence and help mitigate some of those racial disparities. Thank you. And thank to our panel, thank you to our panelists and to the chairman, chairwoman with that, I yield back. Uh, the gentlewoman yields back. Uh, the chair now is very pleased to recognize 
the um, doctor, the gentleman from uh, Pennsylvania, uh, Dr. Joyce, followed by our colleague from uh, Delaware, uh, Ms. Blunt Rochester. So you're recognized, doctor. Good to see you. Thank you for yielding, Madam Chair mm -hmm. and Ranking Member Guthrie. Thank you for all the witnesses for being here with us today to discuss this incredibly important issue. I wanna first talk about a case that I personally was involved with. 10 years ago, I diagnosed Charlie, a 62-year-old man with melanoma on his right thigh. And that diagnosis, the disease was only found locally and further evaluation showed that there at that time was no spread of the disease. Two years later, he developed evidence of metastatic melanoma involving internal organs. And then he received what was at that time standard of care therapy with interferon. And unfortunately, his melanoma progressed. Subsequently, he was started on one of the new immunotherapies that have been approved for metastatic melanoma, similar to what we know President Carter has subsequently received as well. Initially, his disease did respond to the therapy, but within weeks, the melanoma continued to spread. My then 64-year-old patient was started on a different immunotherapy to treat, his to treat his melanoma. His response was remarkable and it was significant. He continued on that therapy until complete remission of the disease was attained. Today, 10 years later, he is symptom-free, he is disease-free. His imaging studies, which include CAT scans, MRIs, PET scans, show no evidence of disease. Last Friday, April 30th, I talked to Charlie on the phone and he has such great insight on how the opportunity to have tried two different immunotherapies as a treatment for metastatic melanoma have allowed him to be completely cured. During that phone call, I asked Charlie, if he had been given the opportunity to have tried a second immunotherapy, but not have had that here in the United States, he said I would have pursued it wherever I could. But given the opportunity to have tried a second immunotherapy after the first one failed, I asked Charlie, what does that mean to you? Charlie's very blunt and straightforward with me. He said, without the opportunity to have tried two immunotherapies to treat my metastatic melanoma, I would be dead. The drugs that he was allowed to use were Opdivo and Keytruda and they presented huge advancements in the treatment of metastatic melanoma. The chance to have two therapies for metastatic melanoma has allowed today for patients to be cured. My questions first are for Dr. Gupta. Knowing that there are countless tragic stories of physicians in other countries who cannot allow their patients to have these innovations because they don't have access to it because of their government authority. Opdivos is only approved for five of the 14 indications in Australia. And in France, only four of the 14 indications are approved. This frustration should serve as a warning to all of us, to American patients, to American physicians, that if we go down the path of HR3, we're going to lose access, innovation, and cure. Dr. Gupta, as a physician, can you tell us more about what HR3's foreign price controls would mean for U.S. physicians and for the patients that you serve and the patients that need these innovations? Well, th thank you, Congressman, for the opportunity. And I think it's absolutely right that other countries have shown a willingness to block uh, groundbreaking medicines um, from, from reaching their citizens. And I think that that's morally indefensible. I think that's the last thing that we should be trying to import from another country. Uh, as a physician, you know, having had the pr pr privilege of practicing medicine like yourself, what I most wanted for my patients was for them to get the medications that were prescribed to them. And there should be nobody coming between a patient uh, and their doctor. Um, and I think that we should not be emulating the systems that other countries have to blockade innovations from getting to patients. So is it fair, Dr. Gupta, to say that American doctors could be put in that position where they wouldn't be able to prescribe what they know their patients need and what they know could cure their patients. I think that's possible, yes. And does that mean that these patients, particularly our most vulnerable, may be at, at risk for worse health complications, worse outcomes, if 
restricted access to drugs and therapies were implemented. Absolutely. As we've heard, not just, not just days, but hours and minutes can matter. And it's a matter of getting innovative drugs to patients as fast as possible to help the most number of people. Um, and I think that's, the, that's what we all are attempting to do. I thank you for your answers. Madam Chair, I thank you for allowing us to present and talk about access, innovation, and cure. And I yield my remaining time. The gentleman yields back. Uh, it, uh, it's a pleasure to recognize the gentlewoman from Delaware, um, uh, Congresswoman Blunt Rochester, and she'll be followed um, by the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Hudson. So you're recognized, uh, Lisa, great to see you. Good to see you, Madam Chairwoman. And thank you so much, Madam Chairwoman, for your leadership on this issue. I know we've talked many times about it on the floor as well as in committee, and I know this is a priority. And thank you especially to our ranking member and the witnesses for joining us to here today. Um, as evidenced by the interest and ideas of my fellow members, um, you can see that um, we all know that the current system is not sustainable and that the focus really needs to be on making sure that Americans are well and safe. And Ms. Ball, I especially want to thank you for sharing your story with us as someone who has both spent much of your life caring for others as a registered nurse and as a multiple, multiple sclerosis patient yourself. Um, today, you represent millions of Americans who are struggling to afford medications that improve their health and save their lives. The pandemic has been hard on many families like yours, and it is unacceptable that you and so many others should have to really choose between taking medications and paying your bills and while the prices continue to rise. And so, Ms. Ball, you mentioned that the cost for your medication has gone up substantially over time. What did you mean? Um, uh, what did that mean for your out of pocket spending when your drug cost increased? And how did it impact your monthly budget for other things like groceries and gas? When I received the um, information that I had the grant, it was $6,000. I called so many pharmacies to see if it could be less. So basically, we tried to rearrange everything that we could um, as far as groceries and um, going to live at my daughter's house. Um, also, having the fact that I wasn't able to practice anymore, so there was no income coming in. As far as groceries and such, um, when I made the final decision that I couldn't take the drug, that kind of put it back in a little bit into perspective. But in essence, it is a very difficult very difficult. When I did my $1,800 at the very beginning of my diagnosis, it was, it was, I had to move to a smaller place. I had, there was many, many, many things. And I had the advantage of having a family that could help me. And there are many of us out here that don't. I know you talked about the um, increase in the price year after year. What sticks out to you the most about that experience? I guess what sticks out to me is that if they would have um, been doing something innovative, if they were doing something that was reaching to a cure, I could have understood even for a small amount of time because they have to pay for what they are doing. But the fact that it, all it was was a way of them to um, take the price up for something that is absolutely the same. It wasn't really approved in the sense that they didn't think it made the um FDA and the people from NIH didn't feel that it had given any kind of improvement, and it didn't. So that's a lot of money that um, people are putting out for something that's not coming close to a cure. And, and what do you think that uh, this means for retired Americans who live on fixed incomes? And, and lastly, from your perspective, could you also talk about the inflation rebate proposal included in HR3? And if you think that that would help you afford uh, the prescriptions that you need? Well, for people that have a, um, that are retired, such as myself, um, it is very difficult because you only get so much in Medicare. So if you have a $2,000 cap, which would be great, and you don't have the bill, don't have the amount of money um, as far as negotiating the money for us to get the right amount of money um, to pay for it, the 2000 cap won't help. So we need to be able to do that. And I must apologize. I'm not very well versed on that part of that because we I have never had to work with it. But thank no you for problem. asking me. No problem. Thank you. And Ms. Sachs, um, I just had a question for you. What 
What do you say um, to people who say that HR3 won't actually lower the cost of drugs? I say that it, it absolutely will lower the cost of drugs, not only for patients, but also for payers. And here, I think the CBO's estimate of how much it would save $456 billion over a decade. If that's off even by a little bit, it would be a tremendous savings for American patients, savings which could be used to expand access to insurance more generally. Thank you so much. I think what we have heard today is that this is a complex issue, that we need to be comprehensive in our approach, and that we need to make sure that we are watching out for our constituents, as well as not stifling innovation. Um, I believe that we can do it, um, and we need to do it. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, and I yield back. The gentlewoman yields back. It is really a pleasure to welcome back to the committee uh, our wonderful colleague, Mr. Crenshaw. Uh, a lot of us prayed for you. It's great to uh, see you. Uh, hope you're feeling 100% better and that uh, what you endured has uh, brought you back uh, to full eye strength. And we're, I'm so happy to see you. I hope you got my message too. So uh, you're recognized for five minutes, Mr. Crenshaw, and you'll be followed by our uh, colleague from Minnesota, Ms. Craig. Uh, uh, Mr. Hudson had to leave. So uh, that's why you're next. Good to, really nice to see you. Oh, thank you for the kind words, Madam Chairwoman. It's a pleasure to be with you all. Um, I still can't see you. <laughs> So, uh, but I do feel better. Uh, I, I should see normally in a, in a few weeks, I hope. Uh, I've, I've got to wait for this procedure to sort of um, uh, follow its its natural path. So, but uh, we're optimistic that I'll that I'll have some sense of normal in, in a few weeks to a month. Great. Thanks Great. for all the wishes. Really appreciate yeah. it. Mm -hmm. But uh, like I said in the last hearing, even, even a blind knuckle dragger can do hearings. So here we are. Um, look, th this bill is really important. I've been talking about this bill for a, a long time and appreciate uh, us doing a hearing on this on this really important topic. I think we all want lower drug prices. I, I think the question is, how do we get there without, um, you know, killing the goose that lays the golden egg? Uh, there's been a lot of concern about innovation. There's been a lot of concern about the fact that when we reverse incentives uh, to invest, that that and one study shows that this will directly hit the smaller biotech firms. Over 90% of them um, will reduce their investment. Um, we'll see a massive decrease in new cures, cures that, that could save lives, that could reduce healthcare costs in the long term. Um, and we talked a lot about negotiation. And Ms. Sachs, this question is for you. Is it really fair to call the process laid out here a negotiation? Yes, I believe it is. Nothing in HR3 tells a pharmaceutical company what they can and can't charge. They limit how much those companies are able to demand those prices of the federal government. Right. But if they don't come to the table with the federal government, they're, 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 they're levied a 95% tax on their revenues, correct? That doesn't seem like a negotiation. It seems like an extortion. And right now, Medicare is the price taker. They have to accept the prices being demanded by pharmaceutical companies and have relatively little ability to push back on those prices. Okay, That's so not how a free market negotiation works. Right. But if I want your, if I'm the government and you're a private citizen and I want your services and you say, well, for that price that you're offering me, sir, I won't give you my services. And I say, if you don't give me your services, I'm going to levy a tax on you. 95% of your revenues from now on. That's not a negotiation, not, nothing close to it. The, the other problem I see with, with the process laid out here is, again, it's called a negotiation, but that's not how bureaucrats work. They can't work that way because, because of the Administrative Procedures Act, because of Section 1871 within Medicare, it can't possibly work that way. It can only work as a formula. And so it's, it's, it's just simply false to say it's a negotiation, isn't it? Isn't it just price setting? So I would welcome more details on how the Administrative Procedure Act is a barrier here. It's not entirely clear to me how it would be. What I will say but, is that CMS... Oh, I'm sorry. And, let, mm -hmm. let me, let me explain, I'll explain it really briefly. What it basically says is that you have to have an objective way of setting a price. It can't be subjective. And of course, this makes sense because we can't give one company a, a, a subjective negotiation, say, hey, you know what, we'll give you 90% of your cost. And then we say give another company only 80% of the cost. You're a lawyer. What would happen? You'd have lawsuits. You'd have endless lawsuits. That's why we have these procedures in place. 
So what we have here is a clear delegation to the secretary of the criteria they should use in engaging in negotiation. Exactly. And and every lawyer and every lawyer we've talked to, every single one says there's only one outcome that will happen here. The secretary will set up a formula. It's not going to be the secretary talking to the CEO of Pfizer, is it? No, it's going to be a mid-level bureaucrat. That mid-level bureaucrat isn't allowed to think subjectively about how they negotiate, right? They have to follow a formula. There's going to no, be a that's a mischaracterization of HR3. That's an exact, but that's exactly how it'll be interpreted into the rulemaking, wouldn't it? No, I think there's no reason to believe that. Well, that would be every the other lawyer we talked to, counsels from CMS, counsels from CRS, say that that's exactly how this would be interpreted. In fact, it has to be according to eight, Section 1871 uh, from Medicare. I think what's important here is to remember that we're talking about paying prices that are closer to the much lower prices that are being paid abroad. And that's setting up the framework for this broader negotiation. And the secretary is given the discretion to use different criteria to negotiate within that framework. And that may be the case for older drugs, but newer drugs will simply not be invested in. Again, I don't dispute your earlier comments that it would immediately lower drug prices. Of course, I mean, by law, it's making their drug prices lower. The concerns we have are, of course, with innovation. And look, let's get philosophical for a second. I think that if we had all the cures, all the drugs that we would ever want for the human race right now, they existed, you could make a good moral argument that the government could just confiscate them and and deliver them to people, right? You could make a moral argument that way. But of course, that's not the situation that we're in. The situation we're in is that we want more drugs available to us. In America, we have access to a lot more innovative drugs than any other country. There's a study of of the over 300 new drugs approved since 2011. America has access to 87% of them. Something like Australia, something like Australia has 39% access. So uh, the UK is 50%. Canada has less than 50%. So innovation is a big deal. I don't know who was just talking, but I reclaim my time. Uh, Miss Davis, I don't, and I don't know if uh, I have Mr. more time. Mr. Uh, uh, Crenshaw, your time, I'm sorry, your time has expired. You're over oh, by Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I'm sorry, seconds, can't, so. see, can't see the timer. I apologize. Yeah, no, that's all right. Thank you. Uh, I gave you a little more time so you could finish your a couple okay. of your sentences there. And uh, again, we're we're really thrilled that you're back. Keep making I appreciate progress. It, thank, you, Please. Thank, thank you for thank you for indulging me. I'm sorry, I can't see the timer. That's all right. That's okay. Um, now it's a pleasure to recognize the gentlewoman from Minnesota, um, uh, Congresswoman Craig, uh, to be followed by, we don't have any Republicans uh, left, so there's going to be a string of Democrats following uh, the gentlewoman from um, Massachusetts, uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Traham, will follow uh, Congresswoman Craig. So great to see you, Angie. You're on. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, and thank you to our panelists uh, for your uh, patience and resilience here today in this hearing. Look, the burden of high out-of-pocket costs for drugs on Medicare beneficiaries is significant. Over the next decade, approximately 1.1 million older adults are predicted to die prematurely due to this cost burden. One study found that if Medicare is able to negotiate lower drug prices and cost sharing responsibilities for beneficiaries uh, are reduced, it may decrease premature deaths by about 94,000 per year and generate nearly 500 billion in savings by the year 2030. This is particularly important for those today who must choose between filling their prescriptions and treating their illnesses or paying their bills. Bob Miller is a constituent of mine living with MS. Over the course of 12 years, the list price of his medication rose from $13,000 a year to over $103,000. While on his employer's coverage, Bob was able to get copay assistance to make the drug affordable for him. But under Medicare, he is now ineligible for that same type of assistance. Faced with the reality that the cost of his drug that would jeopardize his retirement security, Bob opted to stop taking the drug. He understood that he was rolling the dice on his health and he wants Congress to act so that no one else must make this life-threatening decision. So let me start uh, with Professor Sachs. Can you generally describe how HR3 will benefit low-income people in particular? 
Recognizing that some people have access to cost sharing assistance through the low income subsidy may already have some help, but what about others who don't qualify for this extra help? How would their out of pocket expenses and premiums potentially be lowered? Thank you. And this is an important question to think about where the low income subsidy phases out and how it isn't helping enough seniors who may be on fixed incomes especially. So this out-of-pocket cap would be particularly helpful for seniors who are just out of low-income subsidy qualification, but who have these expensive out-of-pocket costs. Professor Sachs, uh, you heard my uh, statistic that I cited there. Uh, Do you agree that lowering drug costs and reducing out-of-pocket expenses could prevent premium death, as recent studies have shown? Yes, relying on those studies. And it's really easy to see how that's true for something like insulin. Absolutely. Uh, Additionally, the Congressional Budget Office has estimated that the Medicare program will save billions because people can finally afford to take their medications. Uh, Do you expect H.R. 3 will also lead to better health outcomes? Yes, especially or potentially for low-income beneficiaries given those high out-of-pocket costs that they face today. Thank you so much. You know, I recently introduced H.R. 2464, the More Help for Seniors Act, that would expand the ability for seniors to receive extra help under the Part D low-income subsidy program. Not only do we need to provide more help to low-income seniors so more can take advantage of the program, we need to effectively reduce, reduce drug costs for everyone. That's why I personally believe HR3 is so important. It's clear that lowering costs for seniors will not only improve their lives, but research has shown that for thousands of people each year, it will also save lives. And, you know, I've got just a little more uh, than a minute left. um, And I just want to say that uh, much of the question and discussion here today, uh, as someone who spent more than 20 years working in medical technology, for a company that had to compete for uh, to be on uh, the VA contract uh, every couple of years, some years we were, some years we weren't for the technology company that I worked for, I, I just have to say that the sky is falling uh, dynamic here is just frankly unbelievable. And if you look at net operating profit for any large brand name pharmaceutical drug company in this country, Um, It's really hard for me to believe um, that this sector that has uh, continued to just increase price, increase price, has never really been held to account uh, here. Look, we know, we all agree that we have to balance innovation. But at the end of the day, I think this sector in healthcare, um, you know, has been able to escape uh, any or much of the accountability in this country for what has happened with drug costs. And, you know, let's talk about, uh, we don't have time today, but, you know, specialty drugs and compound drugs. Look, this sector needs more competition, not less. And at the end of the day, Medicare, just like the VA, should be able to negotiate its drug pricing in the United States of America. And with that, Madam Chair, I yield back. The gentlewoman yields back. We all benefit from Uh, your um, membership on our subcommittee. Uh, And uh, now the chair um, with pleasure recognizes the gentlewoman from Massachusetts, another new member to our uh, subcommittee. Uh, All of our new members are just such value added. I keep saying this every time I introduce them, but I think that um, it's important to reiterate. Uh, The Congresswoman from Massachusetts, uh, Ms. Trahan, uh, and she will be followed by um, uh, um, uh, our colleague from Texas, uh, Ms. Fletcher. So, Lori, thank you for your thank patience. You, yeah. Thank you so much, Great Chairwoman. Thank you. I love to see the backgrounds of everyone. They're so varied. Yours looks especially lovely. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate like that. You. And I, I appreciate this hearing. Uh, our ranking members, certainly our witnesses who are with us today, uh, I did want to respond to um, my colleague's argument that if uh, if HR three was in effect, we we would not have COVID nineteen vaccines and treatment, which I find to be misguided, and would like to just spend a bit of time clearing. 
uh, or setting the record straight. You know, as my colleagues will remember last Congress, we passed billions of dollars of funding for NIH and BARDA to aid in the research, development, and manufacturing and purchase of, of COVID-19 vaccines and therapeutics. Uh, we just followed that up with even more in the American Rescue Plan a few months ago. That funding, along with the hard work and, and expertise of NIH and BARDA and YES, our private pharmaceutical manufacturers led to the development of several safe and effective vaccines. This has been a collaborative effort. Uh, take the Moderna vaccine, uh, for example, the first product the company has ever commercialized. The United States invested two and a half billion dollars in clinical research, development, manufacturing, and purchase of just that vaccine, removing almost all of the risk for the pharmaceutical manufacturer. And before last year, Moderna was already relying on the work of the NIH to help develop its mRNA technology. Almost all of the company's investment in its vaccine came from these federal dollars. I'll also note uh, for the Pfizer vaccine and all of the authorized vaccines, the federal government negotiated the price it would pay. These resources went to manufacturers due to the bipartisan work of Congress, which paid off massively for the American people. So negotiation never would have hurt the ability for vaccines to come to market. And using that as a scare tactic just doesn't stand up to the facts. You know, Professor Sachs, I'd love for you to just comment on this. It, it might be helpful uh, just to hear uh, unequivocally, you know, if HR3 had been enacted prior to the emergence of COVID-19, would it have impacted the ability to bring COVID-19 vaccines to market? Absolutely. And I want to be clear, nothing about HR3 would have impacted the creation of Operation Warp Speed or development of vaccines and treatments for COVID-19. And in fact, Operation Warp Speed, as you said, it helped encourage the development of new vaccines. That's exactly the type of government initiative which disproves the idea that there's a trade-off between innovation and access. And then just one more brief comment. This is what's important. Congress made the decision that patients could not be charged out of pocket for these products. They were to be provided free at the point of sale or treatment to those patients. So we have both innovation and investment from the federal government and no cost access for patients. Thank you for that. Well, HR3 takes a bold step uh, to flip the status quo on a system that has made billions in profit while working families like the one I grew up in, are struggling to pay for their life-saving medicines. Ms. Ball, I just want to thank you once again for coming here today. Your story is one that resonates personally. You know, my father has had MS for the past 27 years, and in the early days when he was healthier and could walk, he would come to Capitol Hill for patient advocacy days. And I've seen the sacrifices that he and my mom have had to make for his treatment and care. Uh, you know, MS is an unpredictable and it's a costly disease. And, and your testimony today uh, was so helpful. In my remaining time, I think one critical area that I think must remain at the center of our policy discussions is health equity. We've had so many hearings that have highlighted the disparities that exist across our healthcare delivery system and prescription drugs are no exception. Uh, given the disproportionate impact the, the, that the pandemic has had on communities of color, Congress does have an urgent responsibility to address those disparities that have long predated COVID-19. And so, Ms. Sachs, uh, with the remaining time, it's, it's common sense that if people can afford to take their medications, that they will remain healthier. How will the policies in HR3 lead to better health outcomes for low-income communities and, and people of color? Yes, it's certainly my hope that the lower drug prices created by HR3, both through the Medicare out-of-pocket cap and the negotiation provision, will allow for increased adherence, increased affordability, especially in low-income communities and in communities of color, and can, can help really mitigate some of these racial disparities. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. I'll yield back the, the no time I have left. <laughs> <laughs> I would thank the gentlewoman. Uh, excellent line of questioning and uh, observations. Uh, I'm proud of all the members of our subcommittee. I, I think that um, it's the best subcommittee at Energy and Commerce. How about in the whole house, everybody? That's how proud I am of you. Okay, now uh, the chair is going to recognize the gentlewoman from Texas, 
uh, Ms. Fletcher. And then following her, uh, there are four members that are waving on. Uh, and, uh, and then our colleague, Dr. Kim Schreier, has asked to be last uh, because she has a conflicting event. So I don't want anyone to think that I'm uh, leapfrogging over her. So uh, pleasure to recognize you, Lizzie, and you have five minutes, and then we'll take the members uh, that are waving on to our subcommittee today. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much, Chairwoman Eshoo, uh, for holding this hearing today. Um, bringing down the cost of pharmaceutical drugs has been one of my top legislative priorities um, and obviously is one of this Congress. As we've heard today, there's been a bipartisan priority for many, and many of the bills being considered today have bipartisan support. But a lot of the questions and comments in today's hearing have, seem to have presented us with a false choice between lowering drug prices for Americans and developing innovative new treatments. So I'm really grateful to our panel for insights, all of your insights today, and I'd like to focus a little bit on this issue, the idea that high drug prices provide a funnel for innovation, and if profits decline, it will impact efforts to find new cures. You know, at the same time we hear that, industry experts have noted that the pharmaceutical industry is one of the most profitable sectors and sees greater profits than other industries on the S&P 500, for example. So, uh, Professor Sachs, can you briefly discuss whether there's evidence for the claim that high drug prices are truly the conduit for innovation? Would the pharmaceutical industry continue to invest in R&D if HR3 became the law, or would it no longer invest in R&D if we were to pass HR3? They absolutely would continue to invest in R&D. Now, to be sure, there are projections that there would be a small decrease in the number of drugs coming to market over the next decade or more as a result of HR3. But I want to emphasize that it's not just the amount of drugs that we get, it's the kind. We've heard a lot of discussion about the importance and the need for cures. And I absolutely agree with that. We don't just want new drugs. We want good new drugs that fulfill unmet needs for our patients. And uh, economists looking at the creation of Medicare Part D found that it gave a large new subsidy to pharmaceutical companies to do innovation, but that most of that innovation was concentrated in disease classes with lots of existing treatments. So if we're lowering prices a little bit in Medicare Part D, we might be taking away some of those me too drugs but there's no reason to think that we would be limiting incentives for companies to develop these truly new cures because these are exactly the products that command very high prices in other countries against which we would be referencing. Well, thank you for that. And, and that your answer touches on another issue that um, we've sort of covered a little bit today. But I think when it comes to sort of research and innovation, we've talked a little bit um, about the funding that we have um done recently, and there's funding in HR3 um, for research and development and innovation. There's $10 billion of direct funding to the NIH to bolster research in cancer, rare diseases, regenerative medicine, antibiotic resistance, and treatments for substance use disorders, among others. Uh, there's also in HR3, $2 billion to the FDA to enhance drug development, review, and safety, including investing further in activities authorized under the 21st Century CARES Act. So, um, you know, I think that that's important when we talk about research. And Ms. Sachs, would you agree that investments in the NIH and FDA, like these efforts I just described, could help enhance research and development on new drug therapies? Absolutely. And one example of that is we've heard somewhat today about the fact that we really want new drugs for conditions like Alzheimer's. But we've also heard about the fact that even today we have hundreds of, of candidates which have failed clinical trials. So even today without HR3, we don't have these effective new therapies. What we really need is some public investment in figuring out more about how some of these diseases work, about what approaches might be important for private pharmaceutical companies to pursue. So HR3 developed in 2019 isn't the reason that companies have failed over the last decades to find new drugs for Alzheimer's, and it's not going to prevent us from finding a solution either. Um, and thank you. With the little bit of time I have left, there's also some research, recent research that shows that many of the patented prescription drugs, uh, like some of the innovative things we're talking about today, were actually first discovered through taxpayer-funded NIH research and grants. Is that your understanding? 
Yes. And I think we also just heard a little bit about the Moderna vaccine, where there was a huge amount of public investment, not just in the development, but the partnership with the NIH in completing those clinical trials. So that's a very recent example where that's absolutely the case. Well, thank you so much, Ms. Sachs. And um, in the time I have left, I just want to thank all of our witnesses. This is clearly a, a really important topic uh, for, for our constituents and for people across the country. So in addition to supporting innovation, uh, HR3, as well as some of the other legislation we're discussing, is really the critical legislation we need to lower prescription drug prices so Americans can live longer, healthier lives. And with that, Madam Chairwoman, I yield back. The gentlewoman yields back and we thank her. Uh, now we will go to uh, four members um, that are members of the full committee of energy and commerce and they're waving on today and we welcome them. Uh, the first will be um, uh, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Rush, followed by the gentlewoman from um, Colorado, uh, Ms. DeGette, followed by the gentlewoman from Illinois, uh, Ms. Schakowsky, followed by the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Soto. So do we have uh, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Rush? Thank you, you Madam, Madam Chair. So I'm delighted to see you once again. I want to thank you for allowing me to participate in today's important hearing on HR 153. I'm also very pleased to think, if you will, that this subcommittee is once again considering HR 3, the Elijah E. Cummins Law Drug Cost Now Act, which I am proud to co-sponsor. Madam Chair, these bills will take important steps to ensure affordable drug drug prices uh, for Medicare recipients and patients of all ages throughout the country. Professor Carrier, it is nice to see you once again. And I appreciate your coming back to once again testify on my bill, the Protecting Consumer Access to Generic Drugs Act. Uh, while you and I have worked to stop these uh, insidious practices of what is called pay for delay for far too long, is an arguably a complete uh, and complex issue. Can you walk us through an example of a time when this practice has hurt consumers and led to higher your prices for American patients. Sure. So thank you so much, uh, Representative Rush, for your leadership on this issue now and your leadership going back for years. You have discovered the problem of pay for delay settlements as, as early as anyone has. The problem with pay for delay is a brand company pays a generic to stay off the market. And that generic could be delayed for years. And so there are multiple examples involving drugs like Impax and Loestrin and the antibiotic Cipro, many drugs that are worth a lot in terms of revenue where the consumer is delayed getting an affordable drug for years. Thank you very much. Also, Professor Carrier, I appreciate your thoughtful suggestions to strengthen HR 153. Can you please, or would you please, walk us through each amendment and explain why they are needed to stop the practice of pay for delay once and for all? Sure. So for starters, I think that your bill is an excellent approach to the problem. The Supreme Court in 2013 said that pay for delay settlements could violate antitrust law, but the settling parties, and here we include the generics, because the settling generics are just as bad as the brands here, they do everything in their power to muddy the waters, to say that it's not really a payment or that it's a payment for generic services, not really for delay, or that there's no delay because the patent's good. And so your bill would really solve this problem by dealing with the FTC and giving the FTC the power to go after this in court in a way that's really hard now to fix some of these mistakes 
that courts have done, like not recognizing payment, like adopting the scope of the patent test. And so if you were to consider other changes to the legislation, I suggested things like applying it to the patent trial and appeal board. So this is one place where there is the settling parties are trying to hide payment. PTAB settlements, patent trial and appeal, appeal board settlements, are not reported to the FTC. So that would be one place to start. Don't let them hide it there. Include that in the bill. Thank you so very much. Let me move on to Professor Sant. Professor Sant, in your testimony, you discuss various mechanisms other countries implement, have implemented to strengthen the hands of their parents to and the negotiating process to drive down prices, uh, prices rather. Have these policies led to life saving prescription drugs not being covered in other countries? And more importantly, how does HR3 ensure Medicare uh, can effectively negotiate without patients losing access to the medications their doctors have recommended <coughs> and prescribed? Thank you, Congressman. And to your question about how HR3 would protect Medicare beneficiaries' access to these medications, it's important that nothing in HR3 changes, that Medicare is obligated to cover at least two drugs per class, all drugs in the six protected classes. Nothing about HR3 changes that. I want to thank you very much. Madam Chair, again, thank you for your kindness, and I yield back no time because I don't have any time. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you, Mr. Rush. You're always welcome at the subcommittee, and thank you for your important legislation. <clears throat> Excuse me. The chair now has the pleasure to recognize the gentlewoman from Colorado. She's the uh, chair of uh, the Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Investigations and Oversight. Um, great to have you with us, Diana. Uh, and she will be followed by uh, Congressman uh, Soto of Florida, uh, because our colleague uh, Jan Schakowsky had to drop off. And then we'll have, I believe, the last member, uh, last but not least, uh, Dr. Schreier. So uh, there is some light at the end of our carrying tunnel here. And uh, so uh, great to have you, uh, Diana, your five minutes question. And thank you for your patience and joining us. Well, thank you so much, Madam Chair, for allowing me to wave on. I feel like I should be an adjunct member of the committee anyway, and I really want to thank all the witnesses for your tenacity and holding on. Um, and I really want to thank you, Anna, for for considering this um, for considering this this uh, HR three because the Oversight Subcommittee, as you know, has had a number of investigations over the last number of years on on the broad issue of drug pricing. And this is really is a national crisis as we keep hearing, and it's not getting any better. Well, this committee know that I'm the uh, of the Congressional Diabetes Caucus and the largest issue-based caucus in Congress. And, um, you know, we heard about the MS drugs, but diabetes drugs are probably the biggest textbook example of what has happened to patients in America. Because if you're a type 1 diabetic and you take insulin, if you don't get your insulin, you die. And in the past two decades, prices for the most commercially, for the most commonly prescribed insulins went up from $20 to over $200 $250 a vial, which is more than a 700% increase. And the drugs were the same drugs. And the reason is the way that, that these drugs are marketed and because of the of the um, inherent markup in the system. And we, I found this out. See, the problem is members of Congress are actually healthcare consumers themselves. Everyone, all the members on this committee know my daughter, Francesca, and have known her since she was like four years old, some of them. Well, she she was on my insurance and her insulin cost about $30 a bottle. Then when she turned 26, she went off of my insurance, of course. She had insurance provided for her employ by her employer and she went over to get her insulin after she went on the new insurance. Well, her insulin was not listed on the formulary. So guess what? 
she, when she went to get her insulin, it was $312 a bottle for a 26-year-old young woman. And, and I've had so many people tell me they were working for jobs to get their insulin. They didn't know what to do. And, and by the way, excuse me, and by the way, um, when, when, um, when my other daughter, who's a doctor, tried to get her a coupon to get that insulin, the coupon only took $20 off. So anybody who says the coupons fix this situation, it is untrue. So I have a couple of questions for our witnesses. The first one's for Dr. Sachs. Dr. Sachs, how would the negotiation process in HR3 bring down the price of drugs like insulin, which is listed in HR3, for patients who need them to survive? Congresswoman, I want to thank you for your leadership on this important issue of insulin because, as you know, HR3 specifically instructs the secretary to negotiate for the price of insulin. And we have these decades-old drugs whose prices continue to rise. They cost many times more here than they do abroad. Bringing down those prices would be particularly important for patients. That's right. And uh, uh, Ms. Humphrey Ball, I, I just want to tell you, I thought your testimony was very, very moving because you had the same kind of experience that my daughter and many of other millions of Americans um, have in trying to just live, to, to, just to be alive. Now, so what would the impact have been for you if an out-of-pocket cap existed for your medications? Thank you, Representative Tepeda. I am saying that if I would have had that, my life in the five years after I was diagnosed, before I had to quit working, it would have been much easier for me to pay for them. It also is the fact that when you're stuck with you're not getting your drug because of this cost, you have to pick, eat, pay your rent, or get the, the drug that's going to keep you walking and thinking. So that is what the impact was for me. If we had the HR3, um, I would have been able to probably... Um, afford my drugs. And that's what's most important. Well, that's right. I met a young woman who was lit, who, who was working four jobs to get her insulin and she was living in her car. It's exactly to what you're saying. Uh, Madam Chair, once again, thank you so much. This is such a critical issue. And I would hope that our Republican colleagues across the aisle would work with us. If, if they don't like HR3, then work with us to find something this for real, because just having a Band-Aid that we say is, is going to solve something isn't going to actually solve issues like Ms. Humphrey Balls, and I yield back. Well, we thank, uh, uh, we all thank you, uh, Diana, especially for your leadership uh, in, um, uh, in so many areas, but mo most particularly in uh, always highlighting the issue of diabetes. And um, we see you or hear your name, Right next to it is diabetes. So thank you. Uh, now I have the pleasure of recognizing uh, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Soto. Again, uh, another member that has really brought high value to uh, to our uh, committee, and we're uh, we're thrilled to have you wave on. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chair Eshu. Let's start with the facts. Americans pay more for our prescription drugs than any other nation in the world. Many can't afford those drugs, and so they go without. What good is having amazing drugs if many of my constituents can never afford them? Here's another fact. The VA hospital, Medicaid, both negotiate their drug prices. They have done so for decades, yet Medicare cannot. That's why we're here today. Because you have this big gap between VA and Medicaid negotiating, but why doesn't Medicare? And that leads to higher prices for our seniors. This makes no sense. We've had a lot of our colleagues across the aisle talk about competition for years, except for right now. Why? Why are we not talking about how the, the competition is not good for Medicare, but it's good for all these other programs? That makes no sense. And then I hear all the scare tactics to get a. And it reminds me of what we heard back in the 1960s at the founding of the Medicare program. Ronald Reagan said, if you don't stop Medicare, one of these days you and I are going to spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it was once like in America when men were free. 
Wow, well, that didn't happen. George Herbert Walker Bush described Medicare in 1964 as socialized medicine. Yet you all are rigorously defending the program today. Barry Goldwater, having given our pensioners their medical care in kind, why not food baskets? Why not public housing accommodations? Why not vacation resorts? Why not a ration of cigarettes for those who smoke and a beer for those who drink? Ridiculous things were said during this Medicare debate. And Bob Dole, I was there fighting the fight, voting against Medicare. The scare tactics didn't work back then, and they're not going to work now. We have to go forward to make sure that we can increase the access to life-saving drugs for all Americans. And that's what this is all about. And I know I've had uh, countless town halls in my district with Democrats and Republicans and liberal and moderate and conservative areas in my district. And seniors of all stripes, of all political persuasions tell me they're paying way too much. And many of them have to ration their drugs. They have to make sure at the end of the month they take a half a pill or, or half of what their doctor said because they're waiting for their social security check to come in at the end of the month, at the end of the month for the beginning of the first, second month. So they're rationing that. Some of them are even foregoing groceries in the most prosperous nation in the world. That's what the issue is today. I have a question for my fellow Scarlet Knight, Professor Carrier. Uh, one of the areas we've heard some abuses about is in the, the petitions at the FDA. Uh, Professor Carrier, I, I'd like to follow up on the portion of your testimony in which you discuss a number of reasons why we should move forward with stopping abuses to the citizen petition process. Um, can you explain why it's difficult for FDA to dismiss a citizen petition currently? Why is it difficult for them to prove both that a petition's purpose is primarily for delay and that there are no valid scientific or regulatory issues raised in the petition? And could FDA's resources be better used if we change that and to an or? Absolutely. Thank you for the question, Representative Soto. And you're right that a lot of these citizen petitions are filed just to delay generic entry. Everybody knows it, the FDA knows it, but the FDA cannot summarily dispose of these petitions. Why? Because the standards are too high. The standards are, as the FDA says, quote, extremely difficult to meet. That's the FDA talking. Why? Because the FDA has to show two things, both of them. First, that there's a primary purpose of delaying the generic. How's the FDA going to know what the brand company's primary purpose is? It's not going to say in the petition, oh, by the way, we're doing this to delay the generic. So it doesn't really know that. And then the second one is the petition doesn't on its face raise a valid scientific or regulatory issue. There is so much scientific legalese in all of these documents that it's really hard for the FDA to conclude right off the bat that there's no issue at all. And so when you put these two things together, the FDA has never used this power. In its annual reports to Congress, it says that the provision, quote, has neither curbed the filing of petitions submitted with a primary purpose of delay, nor, quote, permitted FDA to dispose of petitions without expending substantial amounts of resources. It's important for FDA to summarily deny frivolous petitions. FDA has never done so. That's why switching and to or could make a really big difference. Thanks so much. And there's been concerns about impeding a manufacturer's ability to petition the FDA. In your opinion, if this is a knack, would a manufacturer stakeholder still be able to use the petition process for legitimate scientific or regulatory issues, yes or no? Yes, absolutely. And there's always a sham exception to petitioning. That's what's going on here. Thank you. My time's expired. The gentleman's time has expired, and we thank you again for waving on. Uh, now, last but certainly not least, uh, one of the uh, fine doctors that's a member of our subcommittee, and we're thrilled that she is, uh, the gentlewoman from Washington State, Dr. Kim Schreier. Thank you, Kim, for your patience. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for your patience and thank you to our witnesses. Um, this is such an important discussion. And while much of our work this past year was really focused on the immediate need to combat the pandemic, the urgent need to bring down the cost of prescription drugs has not gone away for my constituents or any others. And like so many of my colleagues have already hi highlighted, many of our prescription medications cost far too much and their prices have continued to increase for no reason far faster than the rate of inflation. And even when nothing about them 
has changed. We heard about Capaxone and Humira, and insulin is another classic example. I have type 1 diabetes, and so I just want to show you how tiny this little bottle is. Uh, 20 years ago, this bottle of insulin cost $40. And now it costs over 300 and nothing has changed about it. That holds 10 milliliters, two teaspoons of medicine that I can't live without. And most insulin users use two or three bottles a month. So this is just ex one example of why this issue of drug pricing is so important. And that example is particularly egregious, kind of the poster child for price gouging, but the issue is nuanced. And Professor Sachs, you were quoted a couple of years ago as saying, we probably are under rewarding drug innovation for some types of diseases, such as early stage cancers requiring long clinical trials and then over rewarding it for others. And I was hoping we could talk a little bit about innovation and that point, because there's a big difference between new life-saving, curative, truly transformational treatments and a second, third, or fourth drug in a class that doesn't really represent a big therapeutic advantage over existing therapies. And I'm from Washington State. Here are a couple things that have happened in my home state, which is a hub for cancer tr treatments, cell therapies like CAR T, gene therapies. One local company spent more than eight years pioneering personalized cancer immunotherapy for patients with lymphoma that hadn't responded to anything else. Uh, by going to a special manufacturing facility, changing the cells, re-engineering them to fight cancer. There's also a one-time gene therapy that's showing promise for patients with thalassemia, potentially freeing them from a lifetime of transfusions. And there are countless oncology treatments that meaningfully extend survival and improve quality of life. But research and development is not easy, and there's no guarantee of success, and it can take many, many years. And so I want to talk about the nuance and the use of a scalpel instead of a hatchet in these conversations. Can you tell me, Professor Sachs, how can we better incentivize innovation that represents these therapeutic advances instead of the Me Too drugs uh, that just follow on what we already have? Thank you for this very important question. I think you're absolutely right to quote my own words back at me because I don't think that all drug prices are too high and should just be decreased. I think some drugs are priced too high, but others are not. I think we need more investment in certain areas, but we probably have too much investment in some of the Me Too areas, like you mentioned. So in my opinion, this isn't just about the number of drugs that we get it's about the kind. We want innovation that works for patients. We want cures. And the better a drug is, the more we'll pay for it and the more we should pay for it. And so all of that really matters in thinking about comparative clinical effectiveness, which is something not just many countries, but also U.S. payers do. We say, is this drug better than the current drugs we have for treating the same condition? If it's not better, maybe we don't want to pay more for it. But if it is better, we should pay more for it. And so thinking. Right. And even the notion of, you know, what would it cost us over the long run for this patient to have all of these horrible consequences? How much time would they spend in the hospital if we didn't have it? And that's a way to think about whether the cost of a drug is justified. I was just going to ask about HR3. Can you, can you tell me what guardrails are already in HR3 or could be added in order to ensure that those innovative treatments are treated differently, that we take into consideration the big benefit? How can we make sure that, that happens? Absolutely. So HR3 already instructs the secretary to think about comparative clinical effectiveness, right? Is this drug better than other drugs for the same condition? If so, that matters as to how we think about negotiating and setting a fair price for that product. HR3 is also limited to the top spending drugs in, in Medicare and more generally. So a lot of rare disease drugs won't even be eligible for negotiation, and rare disease patients should have fewer concerns about the impact of negotiating on the price of those drugs. And they will take into consideration when we have a treatment for Alzheimer's, for example, that will be worthy and valuable and will be treated as such. Thank you, and I yield back. We all pray for that day. Thank you, Dr. Schreier. Uh, well, I think that, that um, uh, we have uh, heard from uh, 41 members, uh, witnesses, 
So uh, you have really held our attention. We, uh, I want to thank each one of you on behalf of all of my colleagues today. Um, uh, each one of you brought uh, uh, great value in your testimony. Uh, so uh, a great shout out and uh, enormous thanks to each one of you. Uh, Therese Ball, uh, Michael Carrier, uh, Dr. Gupta, uh, Crystal, um, Crystal Davis, and uh, Rachel Sachs. You really got a work out there, Rachel, uh, from, uh, from both sides. Uh, but uh, uh, very sincerely, thank you to each one of you. Uh, and on behalf of the American people, because they are uh, listening in. And um, I think that this was a, um, uh, a 101 on the, uh, on the subject matter. Now, uh, um, I need your help, uh, Mr. Guthrie. Uh, we have how many? 90. We have 90 documents um, that I would like to move to place in the record. I don't think that you want to stick around to have me read 90 of them. I'm sure. Yeah, I, I won't do that. So I'll, have unanimous, I'll give you unanimous consent. All right. Not well, to thanks. read. Okay. So um, uh, uh, as ordered uh, and uh, all the documents uh, that have been submitted to the um, subcommittee uh, will be made part of the record. Uh, now, pursuant to committee rules, members have, as you know, or may not recall, you have 10 business days to submit additional questions for the record. And as I said to the witnesses, uh, you will be hearing from members. Uh, many of them will submit a written question. Uh, and we ask the witnesses to please respond uh, as promptly as you can to any questions you receive. Uh, so with my thanks to each one of you, uh, both for the tone, the value of your observations, your questions, the answers of the witnesses. Uh, I think you've just been terrific. This has been a rich hey, hey, Chair, experience. Chair, yes, Mr. Brecker, certainly. All right. Um, I think I said I'll give you unanimous consent. I actually can't do that. So I'll move you. I unanimous ask for consent. I ask for unanimous consent. Okay, I will not object. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Guthrie. Appreciate it. You're so wonderful. Can you imagine if we had to sit here for? to listen to me read out 90. Um, where was I? Yeah, I think at this time, I can say that the health subcommittee meeting of today is adjourned with my thanks to all of the members and our superb witnesses. Thank you. And everyone stay healthy, please. We need you.